why don't as they get, I'm sure they'll be joining in a minute, um, but why don't we get going? And I want to welcome everybody. It's 6.34 p.m. on June 9th, our first meeting of summer uh, 2020. And welcome to the Santa Barbara Unified School Board meeting. Um, I'm Laura Caps. welcome to those who are here. So I want to start off the bat with our Spanish interpretation explanation. So Ms. Rubicalva, if you could please uh, provide that, I'd be appreciative. Thank you, Ms. Board President. In order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous bi-directional interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you don't have to click on anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you are on a laptop or desktop, you will see a globe at the bottom right of your screen. Please click on the globe icon that says interpretation and select English. If you are on an iPad or a similar device, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation, then select English. When it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear and speak one person at a time and at a moderate pace as the interpreter will be interpreting simultaneously into the other language. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea bidireccional en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Si usted no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, verá un icono en la parte inferior de su pantalla a la derecha, en forma de globo que dice Interpretation, Interpretación. Haga clic ahí y seleccione oh, Spanish, God. Español. Si está usando un iPad o dispositivo parecido, Localice el menú de tres puntos, haga clic en Language Interpretation, Interpretación de Idiomas, y elija Español, Spanish. Cuando sea su turno de hablar, por favor recuerde hablar con voz fuerte y clara y a un paso moderado, ya que la intérprete estará interpretando simultáneamente al otro idioma. Are there any questions? If there are no questions, we will begin. Thank you. Excellent. Many thanks to you. And now with that, I we will do the Zoom Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, I turn it over to you, Mr. Matsuoka. All are welcome to join here. All right, wherever you are, <laughs> place your hand on your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, the States, United of States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic for, for which, which it, stands, it stands, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible. indivisible. With liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. And I, I do want to say that uh, Wendy, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Sims Moten and Ms. Munoz are, are trying to get in here. So I feel for them. We all feel that uh, that anxiety when you're you're trying to get in, but um, hopefully that they will join us very soon. Uh, let's see. With that, I'm going to move to uh, announcement of closed action items. Uh, in closed action, we took two items. The first was to approve unanimously the recommendation for one day suspension of a public employee. The, act the motion was made by Ms. Ford and seconded by Ms. Munoz. Yes. Second action. What's that? Uh, second action was the uh, appointment, a uh, recommend approval, unanimous approval of the appointment of Ms. Hortensia Corral as the new assistant principal of Roosevelt and Adams. The motion was made by myself, Laura Capps, and seconded by Ms. Ford, and the vote was unanimous. So we congratulate uh, Ms. Corral on her new position. And uh, before I proceed further, well, I can turn it over to you, uh, Mr. Matsuoka, for the superintendent report. And forgive me, I'm going to try to on my phone here, try to figure out what's, uh, oh, there's Ms. Munoz, but let's see if I can, oh, and Ms. Sims Moten, sorry about that. We kind of just moved ahead, but we're all on now. All right, in time for the superintendent's report. Mr. Matsuoka. Yes, thank you, President Caps. I have three uh, topics to share with the board and community. First, I'd like to introduce uh, our future coordinate, coordinator of school safety, and that is Ms. Jennifer Belacious. And Jennifer has been invited to join us during this uh, part of the meeting. And uh, three, three of you board members may have remember, may remember Ms. Valacious. She was the Dean of Students at San Marcos High mm -hmm. School for two years. Oh, yeah. And has taken a year off. And now she's coming back in this new role. And we're really excited to have her fill this role uh, for us. 
Uh, it's really helpful that she's had site experience. Um, she's a guidance counselor also by training and background. Um, and, and I love that she's trilingual in three languages. So able to communicate with all different audiences. So uh, with that, Ms. Palacios, are yes. you on? There you are. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so thank you very much for having me here. My name is Jennifer Palacios, and I'm so very pleased to be returning full time to Santa Barbara Unified School District as the coordinator of school climate and safety. Um, I wanted to introduce myself by telling you a little bit about my background and experience. Uh, so I started my career in education almost 20 years ago now, teaching French and English um, in grades 7 to 12 in Toronto, Canada. Um, I became a school counselor early in my career, and I was a high school head counselor for over 10 years. I was also an instructional leader for new school counselors at the university level for over five years in Canada. Um, I've worked internationally in schools in Canada, in Spain, and Peru, and I had the pleasure to join Santa Barbara Unified in 2017 as the Dean of Student Engagement at San Marcos High School. As the Dean there, I was able to use my background in um, teaching and counseling to support the academic, social, and emotional needs of our most vulnerable students in order to re-engage them in their learning. And I was at San Marcos for a little over a year um, until I had my second daughter, Paloma, and decided to return to work part-time so that I could spend more time with my young family. My eldest daughter, Sage, is four. Um, so this past year, I had the opportunity to work closely with Dr. Fran Wagenek as a student services consultant. And I was also able to work with the administrative team at Santa Barbara High School this past spring as a substitute assistant principal. Uh, I'm so grateful for the chance to return to work with the district's leadership team as the coordinator of school climate and safety to continue to serve the SB Unified community by supporting the safety and well-being of our district students, families, and staff. So thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to continuing the work of ensuring a common vision and language uh, around positive climates for learning and aligning aligning school climate and safety practices across the district with a focus on continuous improvement. I'm a strong advocate for students and I firmly believe that all students are able to learn when given the right support. Uh, when we create safe and positive learning environments characterized by mutual respect, trusting relationships and multiple tiers of student support, all students can flourish and reach their full potential. By setting these conditions in our schools, we can continue to improve student learning and achievement and prepare our students for a future that is yet to be created. So thank you so much. Looking forward to working with you all. Yay. Thank you, Ms. Palacios, and we look forward to your service among us next year. <clears throat> Second, I wanted to thank our, especially our principals for all the work they put into organizing whatever version of graduation ceremonies um, that they could uh, create under these conditions. Uh, a lot of it was done in cars because that was allowed. And, you know, graduation is one of the, it's my favorite event of the school year, certainly of my entire career. And, and to not be together as a community, I'm sure has been really hard for our seniors, for our eighth graders, even for our kindergartners. Um, so I just wanted to thank and acknowledge the hard work of all of our staffs. Um, it was great to see teachers out cheering uh, the parades. Um, so well done staff. My last topic is uh, going to be a, a large part of tonight's board meeting. I know we have <clears throat> we have 240 participants on today's board meeting, and that will probably grow as the hour proceeds. You know, we begin every board meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I was struck with the last sentence um, that we pledge with liberty and justice for all. And we've said those words at board meetings for my entire career. We, we have kids say it in the classroom. Uh, it's part of our culture of our country. Um, but today, those, those words are, are really a call to action. I mean, do we really have liberty and especially justice for all? And I believe that's what we're seeing unfold across our nation. Um, you know, the death of George Floyd is one of many moments in our nation's history about the injustice uh, to an individual. 
And so uh, we sent this out to the community and I just wanted to take advantage of the moment just to uh, invite the community to understand where we've been over the last years. Um, board approved the Multilingual Pathway Plan, META, a couple board meetings ago. And that's been a, a, just a huge piece of work uh, to promote um, multilingual pathways and just to ensure that every language and culture is respected and appreciated in our district. Um, in the student requests or student demands, the, the call for ethnic studies uh, graduation or courses, um, you know, we're so pleased to reach tonight where we're presenting uh, two more courses that will fulfill that ethnic studies graduation requirement. And uh, with the leadership of the board um, and staff, we've been on a path to create this as a graduation requirement. And so I want the community to know that we have been working on it and uh, it goes into effect for the freshman class next year. That's a graduation requirement. Um, and that's been a long standing uh, effort by the part of the community as well. As far as equity work, we have had a decade long uh, relationship with Just Communities. And Just Communities has brought us so much um, in terms of resources, programming, uh, capacity, the talking in class, um, uh, the work with families, the work with staff around the IEE uh, residential retreat um, has been deep work in our district and we are proud of that. And then the last three years we've been focused on implicit bias training and proud to share that we have tr trained over 500 of our staff um, over these last three years. So tonight board, I know you've been working hard as a school board on the resolution that's in the agenda tonight. And, and we look forward to hearing the public comment, uh, especially from our students. We're always appreciative when our student voice rises and students, we are really proud of, of the call to action that you are asking of the adults. So tonight we stand with you community and let's become a better society, at least in Santa Barbara. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matsuoka. And I now is the time to talk uh, and allow the board to share their comments and correspondence. And I want to uh, pick up on your your sentiments and and use my time as board president to have our students speak. Uh, we're going to be hearing from more of them later. And again, want to thank everyone who's here. We uh, over 250 people are participating in this incredible time in our history in the school board meeting here and this is democracy and so uh, I reached out to the student organizers of the protest after being so incredibly impressed with the way that that all happened in our community 4,000 people uh, peaceful protest students driving it it was just um, awesome in the full sense of the word awesome so Talia Hamilton is has joined us she is one of the main organizers and uh, here she is. And I have asked her to give um, her comments tonight before we go further as, as in this time for the board to be speaking. Thank you, Talia, for joining us. Hi, I'm Talia Hamilton. Um, I'm a rising senior at San Marcos. And basically our whole entire idea of the peaceful march was because a lot of the marches that were being held were adults organizing them and it's awesome that the older generation cares, but of course we are the rising generation. And I think it's really important to have our words be heard because a lot of the time we have, you're just a kid, you know, like you can't really do anything. And, you know, we wanted to prove that we can actually put something really impactful together. So we all came together and we wanted to do something. Shakir came to me originally, Shakir Ahmad. He goes to San Marcos as well. He's a rising junior and I'm right now the president of Black Student Union at San Marcos, so he really wanted to collab and make it work. And it blew my mind to like show up. I wasn't even expecting that many people to even be there. And more people just kept coming in and coming in and coming in. And soon it was like thousands of people almost like coming together. The police actually came up to us in the beginning, well, a couple of them, and said that they were there for our protection and that they wanted to close off the streets so we would be able to safely get there and everything, which is shocking to say the least because it's kind of the whole entire reason we're protesting, but they were nodding their heads and agreeing with a lot of what we were saying. So I hope that there will also be some change in the 
Police Department in Santa Barbara for right now. Um, I also would like to talk about our demands that we have been asking of the um, Unified School District. The first one being demanding ethnic studies classes, which are culturally relevant curriculum, which I'm glad to hear has started to become a requirement starting next year, if I'm correct. Um, for Santa Barbara Unified School District, allocate funds to rehabilitation and mental health services for at-risk youth as an alternative for probation and or juvenile hall. A lot of at-risk youth is brown and black minors and can be targeted by law enforcement. So instead of using, um, instead of putting them in juvenile hall, use more rehabilitation and get them back on their feet instead of putting them in a place where it's hard for them to recover. Um, for Santa Barbara Unified School District to defund any contracts they have with the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department and Santa Barbara Police Department. Right now, the SROs cost a lot of money, I've heard, around $100,000 a year. Um, that money can be used elsewhere for other resources for kids that are a lot more helpful. SROs contribute um, are a law enforcement to begin with. Having law enforcement on school can sometimes make kids feel unsafe because of racial biases. And although we don't want that to be an issue, it is an issue and school is a safe place for a lot of kids and to have um, a lot of at-risk youth who are at schools, who where school is their safe place to have law enforcement around there can make that safe place feel a little less safe when there's law enforcement walking around school campus. Um, it can be affected by police brutality outside of school and different things like that. I know for me, I feel super unsafe now because after kneeling in front of the police department, asking if my life and other people's lives in that crowd mattered to them, and three of those police officers did not kneel, I don't believe I feel safe with those police officers protecting, protecting us if they didn't believe my life mattered. So I definitely think that that is a very important demand that we are pushing to get done because if there are police officers in our county that have blatantly shown that they do not believe our life matters, they should not be the ones protecting us. Um, the school pipeline to prison um, household, uh, schoolhouse to jailhouse, it targets at-risk minors. A lot of these demands that we're asking is because the rules already in place are um, targeting minors that are very at risk for already being in those um, situations. Um, Santa Barbara Unified School District publicly condemned the school prison to pipeline. That's what it was. Um, another at-risk youth issue. It's very important that everybody is held accountable for their actions equally, no matter your race. And it is very apparent that because brown and black students are targeted way more. Um, demand Santa Barbara Unified School District implement equitable hiring practices and recruit culturally competent teachers of color to teach ethnic studies class courses. There are a lot of white teachers. I think it's very noticeable. And to have a, t a class that is teaching you about other cultures and we don't see those cultures being taught in the classrooms is extremely, extremely upsetting as a person of color, as a student of color to look into a classroom and not see any teachers or any faces that look like me teaching a curriculum about my culture. If I were Asian, I'd be upset if no, if someone wasn't looking like me teaching my culture to me. And I think that goes without saying. Um, we demand Santa Barbara Unified School District adopt a resolution declaring racism as a public health emergency and allocate resources to implement restorative justice practices to deal with hate crimes. It should be declared a public health, um, public health emergency because our lives are at risk, which is our health. Our lives are very much at risk right now. And um, it's a national crisis. It's very obvious that people of color's lives are way more at risk right now because of police brutality and because of hate crimes. So it's very important that we do that. Um, another thing is, is Schools tend to make a lot of decisions about the youth without our input. And 
when you're making decisions about our health and our futures, I think it's very important to include the youth in that because it is our futures that you're changing and our rules that you're changing. So I think to include the students a lot more on those topics would be amazing. And focus a lot more on racism in schools because teachers sometimes turn a very blind eye on it and it's very prominent. Thank you. Thank you, Talia Hamilton. That was great to hear you right at the top of this really important meeting. Uh, thank you for all that you did and to Shakir and others. Yeah, so, and, and all your students, you are, the, you are the future that we're fighting for here. Okay, with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to anyone from the board to share any comments uh, or correspondence. Uh, Ms. Ford. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, first of all, I must acknowledge uh, Talia, how articulate, heartfelt, and uh, passionate you are as a representative. And I've seen so many of the young people who participated in this march, uh, incredibly moving and impressive, so thank you. And I must acknowledge how challenging and exhausting and exhilarating these times are and how grateful I really am for being part of this community. Um, I do have numerous friends who will not say that last line of the pledge uh, with liberty and justice for all, and it is very clear why. Um, I do have other comments related to the peaceful march this weekend and the demands, but yeah. I'll share those later. And um, here are a couple reasons why I am so appreciative of this community. First of all, a couple Fridays ago, the Santa Barbara Educational Foundation sponsored an outstanding panel discussion titled Learning Together Remotely. The insight, the compassion, the intelligence exhibited by the panelists was nothing short of inspiring to me. And so I want to call out and thank Bill Woodard, Brendan Carroll, Ali Cortez, Kelly Choi, and Joanna Pasco. And I really hope there are more of these opportunities. And second, this past week, during a most historic and turbulent time in our country and our city and our state, throughout the district, as Mr. Matsuoka mentioned, there were many, many creative, personal, and really well-organized promotions and graduations taking place. And I was able to take part in two very different but equally wonderful high school graduations, Santa Barbara High School, go Dons, and Dos Pueblos. Um, and yes, they were creative and personal and well-organized, but most importantly to me, they were student-focused celebrations of learning and I am so grateful for those teams led by Elise Simmons and Bill Woodard who made those graduations possible. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Any other board? Yeah, Dr. Reed. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to first acknowledge Talia for her articulate presentation and for her leadership in this um, important, peaceful protest. And just to tag on to that, the importance for me of, of student voice. I believe it's a powerful tool and crucial to change. And I also believe it's most important, the most important messaging we can hear and give support and credence to. Um, you are our future and have the power to disrupt sy systems of practices that promote racism. And you're doing that now. And we need to push that change like you have done these past few days. Um, I wanted to say that as, as since I've been on the board, I've been a very strong advocate of student authentic opportunities to really share about what their concerns were. And a couple of years ago, we started a process bringing students forward to the board to actually start developing um, action plans that addressed um, issues that they felt were occurring in their um, school environment. That was, of course, with the collaboration of um, our district office and the teachers and principals of those schools. But I think what I feel is even more important as we face this new movement that we need to sustain and keep growing is the expansion of student advocacy and student voice. And so I'm hoping we can expand that along with finding ways to have them participate on our board 
I know in LA they have a student member participate on the board and I'd like to see how we can advocate for that. Um, I, I appreciate the voices of the older students that we've had in the district, but I also wanted to point out those voices I heard when I attended the Monroe talking in class presentation, which was facilitated by Just Communities. And there, it was really, really, um, really important to hear the voices of sixth graders. So I think I wanna make sure that we're not only listening to our older students, but our younger students have a voice. They have a strong voice and a, a voice that needs to be heard. And within that conversation, the sixth graders spoke of their, what they felt were equity issues around education, specifically around barriers and challenges, challenges around remote learning that they talked about their friends that couldn't have access to their classroom because they didn't have internet. They talked about the challenges of um, what was going on with their family and how um, different uh, dynamics in families and large families in one room, even the example, was impeding their getting on the internet to even participate in classroom activities. And finally, they expressed the concern about having the curricula really mirror their identities. They felt that there needed to be, and they, they actually said culturally relevant, you know, curriculum. So I, I was really, I mean, cause that's a, that's a mouthful, but what I'm saying is they were saying, we need to see ourselves mirrored in the curriculum. So um, I just want to say that um, it was powerful to hear them. It's powerful to hear the older students and the convergence of both is what we need to continue to listen to. And just on another celebratory front that Ms. Ford also spoke to is that I was also able to attend two graduations, La Cuesta and San Marcos um, High and be actually involved on the stage where we waited 15 minutes for every student to come through. But it was so powerful and the families were so, everybody was so appreciative. And so I just feel like it was an honor and privilege to be able to take this opportunity to be there and to support our graduates. So once again, thank you to all of the hard work that um, all of the principals did to ensure that these events went off so smoothly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Any other board members? Uh, Ms. sims -Moten. I'm officially unmuted. So thank you. So thank you, Taoyu, for, for just expression of your feelings and, and your experiences is so important uh, in sharing that and how the students, their voices were rising. I, I must admit that over these past few weeks, there are times when I have had no words to, to, to truly express um, just trying to get through the weeks of, of seeing such a horrific event, you know, and people call it an event, but something that happened about a human life being snuffed out um, and that it penetrated every soul and why we're seeing this massive movement um, in terms of that and that it moved us to the depths of our soul to where it feels like there's a different call to action. So 55 years ago when there was a Pettus Bridge going on and there was still a loss of life trying to just get to vote, you know, they were young folks trying to say we matter, we need a vote. And so that started to move some changes. And this is the exact same thing in terms of we need our young voices to continue to move us, you know, to move us forward and, and to, to rise up because it takes a lot of bravery and it takes a lot of courage to do, to do that while you're also wondering if you're safe while you're doing that. So I want to applaud uh, what you do. I want to continue to support and, and nurture your leadership. Your voices are extremely important uh, with regards to that. And I appreciate the peaceful protest, yet it was, it was screaming very loudly that enough is enough and that we matter. And folks that walked along with you, marched along with you, shouted along with you, were saying every, every black life matters. And when you have to speak out for an ally that doesn't look like you, that again is bravery and courage. And so all the young folks that march, um, all the young folks that stood up and continue to march and say that we are not going to take this. We are going to speak. We're going to speak loudly and we're going to speak often. And I appreciate the demands that you have brought to our district because it's important, as you said, these are things that are impacting you 
and we encourage you to, to expand your civic duty, and you have done so in, in a great way. So continue doing what you're doing with regards to that. I look forward to working with you, supporting you, being there for you. And as we look at our policies, really, I appreciate it, Talia, Talia when you were saying include us in the policies that you're making about us, right? So don't do things without us if it's about us. So I definitely heard that. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. And I'm very proud, very, very proud of you. And um, wow, I, I, I can certainly go on. And, uh, but I want to also say that I had the opportunity to uh, participate in the graduations and they were great. And you could see how much the students really appreciated that. And because it's like in, in this special way, it was the, the attention solely on them because they got to stop. <laughs> Usually you're walking, you're shaking your hands, you move it. But there was an actual moment that it was about you as the graduates. And so that was uh, awesome to see uh, in terms of that and the special moments that at families don't often get because we're trying to get through a process. So, and in fact, um, at the graduation uh, ceremony at San Marcos, a lot of the parents were saying, can we do this again? Let's have two, let's have a drive through and let's have another one. We're like, oh, okay. So, you know, just, just in knowing that, that it's different. And this time is calling for a different way that we do things. So, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sims Moten. Ms. Munoz. Ms. Munoz, I think you're muted. Okay. Um, yes, I certainly, you know, I appreciate, you know, the words of, of my colleagues. I'm here with um, Ms. Sims Moten. You know, we're in social distancing in a conference room and um, it's hard to even speak, honestly, um, because it is, it's, it's a wake up call, you know, the reason why we're here, why we're serving on the board. I know I'm serving on the board because of the students and I know that my fellow board members and those in the school district, you know, this is, this is our heart, right? This is what, um, what we're talking about. And I've read, you know, I've read the letters, I've read, you know, every single letter. Um, and also see about, see that the demands are like a wake up call. I'm here, you know, I'm here for um, the students. I'm here for the families and the community. And I'm here to also to learn, to listen. And I know I have a lot to, um, a long road ahead, you know, but know that I'm here, know that you could always reach out to me. Um, and it's brought, you know, a lot of conversations with, um, I know my two daughters are like, mom this, mom that, you know, and stuff. And, and yeah, and, and very valid concerns. Um, the leadership that the youth have shown this weekend and in the weeks past are incredible. You know, Talia, I applaud you, as well as the fellow students that were there that wrote, you know, the signs that wrote the demands that um, uh, about how they feel, what they're experiencing, and those uncomfortable conversations that need to take place. You know, we had started a, a, uh, previously before I was on the board, I'd been in, in ethnic studies um, now and really learned um, from the students. And I'm, you know, just as um, dedicated to that, to seeing where we go with that and, and seeing the, the value of that and having everyone, you know, all the students learn about their history and being able to have support and see their, themselves reflected in the school staff, have themselves reflected in, in the school leadership. Um, I, I'm dedicated, you know, to our black students and their families. I support, you know, um, uh, Black Lives Matter and know that going forward, our community will never be the same. Our school district will, will not be the same. We're seeing it, you know, changes are being demanded at the city level, at the county level, at all levels from, you know, preschool on up. Um, and I'm, I'm here, I'm, you know, I'm interested, I'm vested in, in that and wanna hear, you know, the good, bad and the ugly. Um, so, you know, I just wanna say that and, you know, please feel um, I, you know, that I'm here for, um, for our community and um, please keep the emails coming. You know, we, we need to um, keep hearing from folks in, in this coming year, um, this coming week, this coming hour and, and such. 
Um, so yeah, so I, I did, you know, I did attend the um, Santa Barbara High School and the DP um, high school graduations and saw that, saw the students speak and the, you know, um, the commencement speaker at DP high school was just incredible. And it was just also sharing about where we need to go, you know, what's happening in, in this is not something that's, I want that it's going to happen and it's going to, um, you know, go away. No, we're going to keep going from here and, and building on this. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Munoz, and thank you to the board uh, for all of your powerful comments. And again, to Talia Hamilton for speaking on behalf of all the students. Um, so now with that, we're going to move to public comment. And if I can just explain a little bit of our process here. Uh, public comment is coming up here for non-agenda items. Most of the speakers who are speaking tonight are related um, to this topic, um, many topics, and the demands that were so eloquently put forward. I want to just explain, and I'm going to sound technical, but it's really important. The way that um, our board meetings are run are set by what's called the Brown Act, which dictates how local governments work in California. And that, those agendas have to be set Friday before a Tuesday meeting. And so we have gotten some feedback. Why are you not responding to all of our demands in this meeting? But there's actually no structural way that we, we can. We can certainly um, convey uh, what we hope to and our intentions, but I just want to explain that, that we had on the agenda, and you'll see this uh, in, later on in the, uh, in the agenda here, a resolution um, related to social justice and to Black Lives Matter and to pol police brutality already planned. And so that's why that one piece of many of the six demands uh, will be talked about today. But it by no means does this mean that we're, we're done with this or we, we heard your demands and this is the only thing that we're coming forward with. I just wanted to explain that. This is what an agenda that was set last week on Friday per the governing, per the state of California. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Ms. Trujillo to introduce our speakers for public comment on non-agenda items. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Uh, President Capps, members of the board and cabinet. We have 12 um, requests to speak uh, for this item. And so I will go ahead and start with um, Andy Cal Calwell. Um, Andy, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me all right? <clears throat> can you hear me? Oh, one second. <clears throat> I'm getting one shake in head, okay. Um, my name is Andy Caldwell. I'm the executive director of CoLab. I also write editorials for the Santa Barbara News Press. I'm a radio talk show host. I've interviewed over 10,000 people on my show, and there's a number of subjects I want to talk with you about. Um, in my day job, is uh, I've read every county budget book for the last 25 years, and there's a huge misnomer in this community that we're spending more money locking people up than we are helping them. And today was the county budget hearings, and I just want to bring up one fact. The county right now spends $422 million a year, $422 million a year, on alcohol, drug, and mental health services, social services, and public health, versus $165 million on jail services and patrol. So it's almost three times as much. The other thing I wanna bring up is one of the things that I've tried to do when working with youth is try to inspire them. As many of you know, I'm running for Congress. I'm not here tonight for that. But have, I'd like to know whether your schools ever mention the fact that Kathy Murillo's dad was a gangbanger and she became a mayor. That Joe Centeno grew up under very harsh circumstances and became a police chief, a mayor, and a supervisor. Abel Maldonado, son of a Bracero, became Lieutenant Governor of the state of California. And Salud Carbajal, son of a farm worker, became our Congressman. Are you inspiring the youth or are you instilling victim status? Time. Curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Janet Price. Janet, are you there? I am here. I'm here, can you hear me? Hello? You may begin. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, for some reason, I was under the impression that the sex ed curriculum would be on the agenda tonight. And I know that you have other very important issues that you are discussing. And um, it's been good to hear everything. That student was great tonight. Um, but I still want to talk about the sex ed curriculum. I was an educator for 19 years. And I still believe this curriculum, the teen talk mm -hmm. curriculum would very, be very damaging to the children during their formative years. Um, it teaches them not only how to have sex, but how to have deviant sex in some instances. I've read and look, read and looked at the materials and have seen them. Um, and it's not something that our children need to know until they are adults and are of age. We need to protect our children and students from this sort of abuse at a young age. Um, introducing children to these matters at a young age can be damaging to their psyche. So as a parent and an educator, I wanna urge you strongly not to approve the teen talk sex ed curriculum, but the heart curriculum, which we have shared with you before. It's a better option in that it fulfills all the requirements, is more agreeable to parents and more positive for our children and students. Thank you for letting me talk on this subject tonight. Thank you. Next, we have Lorraine Woodward. Lorraine, um, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, I was listening. It was very interesting. Uh, what I do find is I came from a foreign country, so you should be impressed. I can speak English. Uh, the basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic were focused in my country, and my country is doing much better than your country for education. And I, I'm very disappointed by the American education program where you want to work on ethereal programs. Uh, I mean, such as uh, uh, just communities and what have you. And I think that those should be instead offered as an elective. You need to get kids ready for their future careers or you will see more kids going into that pipeline of prison. You want kids to be ready to leave, leave high school all ready to either go into a career or go into higher education. And for that matter, we don't need multilingual training. Yes, I can speak other languages, but the 1990s in America, you had a similar program that was instituted and immediately disbanded after the results show that literacy rates went down, mathematical abilities went down, increased gang membership and all sorts of problems. And I look at this just communities and we have the same problem. 30 down. seconds. Okay, so now you have with your just communities, you have reduced literacy rates, attendance down. You have an ed if you have educated children, they're gonna be less likely to be discriminating against each other or treating people poorly. And we want kids to be treating other kids with uh, kindness and respect. And by doing that is you want to give them an education where they're not gonna be bored out of their minds, learning about some ethereal programs such as just communities is offering and phenomenally, Phenomenology is unattainable. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, we have Barbara Bastini. Barbara, can you hear us? Okay, here, I got it. Okay. Good evening, Board and Sup Superintendent. We as a city grieve for the horrendous act against George Floyd. As a nation, um, we want justice for the per perpetrator and all perpetrators that take innocent lives. Um, I am very pleased that this peaceful march came together and it was peaceful and nothing, uh, there was no outbreaks of violence. But I have a question, how did we get here to where young people in our community are demanding the Santa Barbara School District to stop funding in our community um, contracts they have with the Santa Barbara County Sheriff Department and Police Department. Why is Just Communities involved a nonprofit organization? Why are kids being positioned to make demands? Whose idea was it to come to the school district? It is obvious that police as a whole do not support this evil. Our police captain leadership in Santa Barbara does not support this evil. Um, the police have been vilified and left out of this conversation and labeled as thugs and, and worse nationally. When I was at Santa Barbara City College, I had a male teacher aggressively try to take advantage of me. I didn't, as a 18 year old, believe that all male teachers are bad. I didn't vilify Santa Barbara City College as a school for hiring this teacher. I understood there are bad apples in every profession. 
what are you going to do, young people, if you get your wish and if robbers come to your house and attack your family, um, who are you going to call? So I know that I'm referring to the fact that the youth have made a statement that they do not want this con uh, Santa Barbara School District to have any contracts with the sheriff department or the police department. And this is very much disrespecting them. And even the young woman who spoke very well, um, I just want to refer to a comment that she made, that she was shocked that the police department, that the police Hi. were helpful. It's, it's time. time. Okay. Yes. Thank you. For next, we have Linda Bonnet. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I was under the impression that Hilda, Hilda Maldonado was going to be here tonight. Um, if she's not here, can she, I mean, if, if she's not on the board, can she hear this? Uh, okay, good. Yeah, she's, she starts okay. July 1st, but I, I, I know that she is watching okay. this. Well, this is, this is to Hilda Maldonado. Welcome. You couldn't be coming to Santa Barbara at a more opportune time. It's time a Latina is the superintendent of schools here. With all this racial unrest throughout our country, state, and city, schools are a great place to start with racial reconciliation. We don't need any more division amongst the races, amongst the classes, or amongst religions. We need to love and appreciate each other for whom we are. Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed for his children to grow up in a colored blind society decades ago. That is still a noble goal today. Seconds. Thank you. Can, is that it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have Ms. Sheridan Rosenberg. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Terrific. So I, I just want to say that um, the core concern of fair education has been that educational research sources, including the LCAP funds, it have been misdirected away from effective literacy programs and towards what we believe is really ineffective and divisive curricula. And I think that failing uh, to educate a child while indoctrinating them is it's bigotry and it's really an, a, a template for institutional racism. And I think that the, the case in point is that the latest call to action from just communities uh, and others is that, you know, judging the abilities of any teacher based on the color of their skin, that is prima facie racism. Not to mention that, you know, 46% of the district students failing California state standards for literacy. Illiteracy is the public health emergency that you really need to be addressing. Thousands of students in your district are not taught how to read. And if you can't read, you cannot learn. The, the biggest concern is the prison, the school to pipeline um, system. And I actually agree with that. But you've misdiagnosed the problem. I mean, 75% of those incarcerated cannot read. And this is your fault. And instead, what you're doing is you are coming up with a very sort of wokeity woke uh, kind of fad of a solution that, I, it, and it's shocking because it sounds as if you're allowing a particular group to pit our district against our local law enforcement, which I, I think does a wonderful job. So I really think that you need to revisit all of this seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Sarah Van Lard. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Van Lant. I've been a teacher in Santa Barbara Unified for the last three years. I teach sixth grade at Adams, and I am speaking to lend my voice in support of the Black Lives Matter student organization and their demands that were given to you on Sunday. Um, I hope you agree with me in thinking that these students are braver and bolder, more organized and more courageous than we ever were, certainly more than I was. Um, our schools and classrooms should be the epicenter for changing our society and for fighting to eliminate racism and the systematic injustice that people of color have faced in our nation for over 200 years. So I implore you to 
keep your word and include them in the conversations moving forward. And I trust that you will put their demands on the agendas, um, but don't ignore our students. Don't ignore our youth. Please act now. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Teresa Martinez. Teresa, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. President Caps and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Teresa Martinez. I am a parent of an elementary age student in Santa Barbara Unified. I encourage your board to adopt the youth demands recently demanded by Santa Barbara Unified students to create systemic changes that would start to make Santa Barbara Unified safe, equitable, and inclusive for students of color. As you can see from recent data on suspension rates in the district, systemic change is needed. Just a few months ago, suspension data was released that showed a 4.2% increase in suspensions district-wide for socioeconomically disadvantaged students, English learners, and students with disabilities when statewide suspension rates had decreased. According to data on eddata.org, 5.1% of suspended students in Santa Barbara Unified last academic year were Black, which is very disturbing because Black students only make up less than 1% of the cumulative student enrollment. This data illustrates how inequitable discipline is being perpetrated against Black students, which will likely result in lifelong effects on the lives of these children, as research shows that children who have been suspended have a higher likelihood of dropping out of school, fueling the school to prison pipeline. I appreciate your efforts to expand cultural liter literacy and combat racism and to include the students as you do it. But as the people who have power to effectuate systemic change, we need to do better. Time. Thank you. Next, we have Gio Duarte. Gio. Um, one moment. Gio, can you unmute yourself? I can't do it. Um, not able to. Okay, unmute. can you hear me now? There. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. I was, I have to use my phone for one thing and the computer screen for another, and I guess okay. something was coming on there. But okay. my Maybe. question is, um, for families who are having custody battles, etc., it seems like a, a, a niche thing, but um, it's important for me as a parent to be able to get access to like Parents Square. I've always been involved in my child's um, education, but since this custody battle started, uh, I'm not being allowed to use uh, G, uh, Neo and uh, Parent Square. But according to the information that I've gotten, um, I just wonder if you have resources for a parent like myself. So um, for non-custodial parents seeking to be involved, it seems like the California Family Code 3025 and AB 497 uh, include wording that even non-custodial parents shall have access to resources such as Parent Square, Neo, and school records. So just wondering if that's something that uh, you have resources for and if someone could get at me with that, I would greatly appreciate it. And I'm sure other parents would also appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll make sure somebody gets back to you. Um, next, we have Lisa Sloan. Lisa, can you hear us? Lisa, hello? Lisa, are you there? Hmm. Um, she's not responding, so um, hello, Lisa. 
um, well, she's not responding, so we're going to go ahead and move forward. And that concludes our public comment on this item. Thank you, Mr. Hill. This is not an easy thing to manage, so I really appreciate it. Uh, with that, um, thank you to our speakers. Uh, there are many other speakers <laughs> in future agenda items, but we'll be moving on to the item of the agenda, which is uh, acceptance of donations. Any motions to that item? Uh, I will move to approve the acceptance do with don of donations with gratitude. I need a second. A second. Ms. Ford, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes. Sorry about that. Uh, we're moving into the consent agenda. Uh, items E through, uh, one through E, one through 11. Any um, board members wish to like to pull any uh, consent agenda items? Ms. Kemp. Yes, uh, Ms. Sims Moten, thank you. Yes, uh, E6. Okay, and I'd like to pull E11, so. Why don't you go, why don't you go first, Ms. Sims Moten? Okay, the, thank you. Can either ask your um, question or just ask for clarification. Um, actually, I need to abstain uh, one of the uh, grantees or actually the contracts for Gateway Educational Services. I am the chair on that board, so I need to abstain from that. Excellent. So we will take a vote on item E6, so that it allows you to abstain on that one agenda item only. Um, anything else? Yes, so on the MOUs for the Mission Scholars, EYC, I believe, and Cal Soap, I did reach out to Dr. Madrigal, and I don't know if she's uh, available to speak. I was just concerned that the EYC contract didn't really address how there's a pathway for college, whereas the other two do in terms of support um, tutoring, and I didn't see that, and, and she did reach back and say there was some clarification, but I just wanted to publicly pull that item because I didn't see that too. And I know that they're going to be working on that um, um, to, to, get, to make that a little bit more clear because it wasn't clear. It felt like it was just going to be going uh, college trips or, or that's it. it was, oh, there's Dr. Madrigal. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so just in the question, so thank you so much for your response, but I really want to just kind of get it on the record, um, your response. So thank you. And um, the response is that you would like, um, so, so the response um, to that question and specifically to EYC um, is that the strategies um, that they employ to, um, to provide um, you know, access and to college as well as support services is through college field trips, um, academic and social cultural support. And, um, but I believe what your concern was, um, board members since Morton, is that we needed to expand those services and the scope of work to be more to clarify those those actual services and list those, is that correct? Yes, and also, you know, the other the other two uh, contracts are speaking to uh, support services such as SAT testing, all of those different things. How we're getting them? That's not clear. That's you know, uh, in that particular one. And in in the other question, so that's what I want clarification. So, and you did respond that you would uh, work on that with them with regards to that. So, so thank you. Um, and additionally, I was just trying to ascertain so that peak, are we, the EYC Mission Scholars and um, uh, Cal Soap, are they augmenting peak? I wasn't clear what their role in in peak in terms of that. Right, that's correct. And um, those three uh, uh, partner agencies um, provide services to all of our SB Unified first gen and low income um, students, uh, regardless of whether they're a peak or avid student. And um, since PEAK is, you know, Santa Barbara Unified's um, strategy um, to promote college readiness for our first-gen students, they work closely with, um, with the PEAK team at Santa Barbara Unified, but these services that they provide are not closed to other first-gen students within our population at SB Unified. 
Okay, and then one last question uh, uh, with regards to EYC. So I know we've talked about over the years in terms of PEAK when you've made presentations with regards to that and that one of my con the concerns I expressed was the fact that there was not any African-American students and, and with regards to how were we uh, doing other outreach strategies to, to ensure that. And so I'm assuming that's what's happening with EYC. That's in correct. In terms of that. I, I, I appreciate that. And sometimes you have to go to someone who looks like you, as you know, Talia had said in terms of that. But I, I want to know that when we're talking about PEAK or any programs, that if there's a certain amount of our students who are, you know, not meeting the minimum standards and they're not in that program just because of outreach issues, I want to know what we're doing with regards to that as a part of our practice. What are we going to do? Not just seek an organization to, in that sense, but how are we doing that in our, you know, in our process, in our protocols? So, for instance, you know, uh, if EYC wasn't an organization, how else would you do to reach out to the African American students or those underrepresented? So that's what I'm just trying to get the overall um, um, practice of what we're doing. Right, and I will also, um, I will also invite uh, Mrs. Carey. Um, to help answer that question. But I think that, you know, it's been a, a, a quite an incredible, um, more formal, I think, um, partnership now with um, the Endowment for Youth, who has access to um, our Black American, um, Black, um, African American families and Black families in, in Santa Barbara and really being able to reach out to them. And again, it goes back to they have that, that trust, you know, with the families. And we saw that in a community engagement um, um, community engagement event that uh, we we both hosted Santa Barbara Unified through the Peak program as well with as well as um, the endowment for youth and so I think that you know some of the strategies that we talked about um, was reaching out to to our you know the younger generation as far as you know reaching down to the elementary schools and really providing some mentorship from you know our our peak current peak tutors and peak mentors to come into those classrooms and really you know really start to reach out to the families and reach out to the students in that way. Were you, Miss Miss Carrie, were you going to say some more? I can, just, I mean, I can respond and build on that, build on what uh, Dr. Madrigal has shared by saying that, um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that this has been a line of, of questioning, right, over the months and years. And I, what I really hear in, inside it is um, the frustration that can come sometimes around the not being seen. And we have problems with that around when we report on things and, and we, we look at data. Um, but we have, we have qualitative issues too around being seen and not being seen. Um, mm -hmm. So I can just let you know that in addition to the efforts that Dr. Madrigal is talking about and, and some uh, meetings that she and I participated in this year that, were, that, were, um, that established some new connections um, among partner, partner groups uh, with the district, that we as, as school leaders uh, at the district office and at sites um, have been ramping up our conversations and conversations are not enough. It takes actions. Um, but we, we do have some things to go on, uh, including the quite powerful um, talking in class experience for African-American students. We've been trying to attempt to hold another, another um, iteration of, of that. And it goes to the points that uh, folks made about the, the importance of the youth voice. Um, and also I, we learned a lot from the uh, families um, families and Dialogue in Action workshop too uh, with African American parents. So it's opportunities like that that give us qualitative information in addition to quantitative information um, so that we can start, and it's actually really ramped up even in the last couple of weeks, um, having more orchestrated intentional efforts as school leaders when it comes to um, seeing, hearing, and responding in qualitative and quantitative ways on our own terms and in conjunction with community partners. So um, it's well heard and it's it's underway and I hope we can continue to talk about it and the progress we make. Right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, just in terms of and I and I appreciate the efforts that are going there. But just to respond to what you said or to add on to what you said about conversations, you know, conversations start to build relationships, right? And therefore, it starts to build trust in terms of that. So it needs to be ongoing. It's a conversation and not always, you know, sometimes at a crisis because we don't we're not meeting a need. But if we have an ongoing conversation, then you're you're building um, you're building the relationship. And so whatever programs we are. Uh, you know, dealing with with regards to underserved or not, you know, underrepresented, 
we know in our practice, in our protocols, we're going to seek out additional strategies, what we're doing to ensure that everybody feels included and, and feel invited. So, so thank you for the work that you're doing, but I just really wanted to really get a better understanding and strengthen the EYC um, MOU to, to include that or make that much more clear. So thank you. If I can just ask for a clarification, would you like us to make those revisions to make some of those pieces more explicit and bring it back on consent or is it advisement for the future? It's advisement for the future. I'm fine. I, it, that was just, it wasn't clear, you know, as Dr. Madrigal said, these are the activities that we're doing, but I just want to be more, much more clear and expansive of that. But we can go through here and, and, and I, we can talk offline if, you know, if you're having issues uh, making those clar clarity issues. Well, do know that we will incorporate those changes. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Really noted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So my recommend re recommendation is to uh, vote on the consent agenda items um, E1 through 11, but minus E6 and minus E11, if that's okay with the board. So I, if so, I need a movement uh, motion for that. Um, uh, Ms. Capps, um, yes. just to clarify that we wanted to pull the, it was the resolution about the refunding right. of bonds. And yes. The, the list got renumbered. Oh, okay. And so it's E9. <clears throat> E9, thank you for that clarification. So I amend that. Uh, I'd like to pull item E9. And if and asked that we vote on I, the items except for E6 and E9, um, and we'll vote on those individually. Individually. So with that, a motion to accept the consent agenda as uh, with the modifications you just stated. Thank you. I second it. Thank you, Dr. Reed. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. And now we'll vote on E6. Uh, but Ms. Simpson will abstain, so we'll, um, we need a motion for E6. <laughs> yeah. So moved. Um, so can I just make a clarification? I'm only on that one contract need to abstain, so is there something different we need to do about it, or does it, just that one abstention means it's the whole abstention of the whole item? Just want to be clear. Uh, my understanding would be that you would have to abstain on the item unless we parsed it out. But because yes, that would be my recommendation because it's it's on the agenda as a package so you have to vote on that item six as a package but i believe well, you're i'll, I'll stay with the caveat that it's just about that item so <laughs> i can yeah. go for there <laughs> understood okay with that i made the motion uh do we have a second on item e6 uh, miss ford all in favor aye aye and carries four uh and with one abstention Thank you. And then item E9, um, I po pulled it with the question that needs to be asked um, about this bond. Uh, will the taxpayers, this is a question for Mr. Tay or Mr. Matsuoka, will the taxpayers fully benefit from this refunding is the question on the table. Yes, Madam President, the, this refunding of bonds will benefit the taxpayers. It will reduce the um, overall liability, the debtness. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. With that, uh, I move to approve item E9. Need a second, please. Second. Dr. Reed, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, with that, we've passed the uh, consent agenda and we are now to um, our action agenda. And like I explained, our first action item is a resolution that was already in the works prior to this weekend's protest and prior to the demands um, that have been made quite compellingly um, towards us to us. So uh, we have quite a few speakers, <laughs> um, about a hundred in fact. So bear with us here. It's super important that we're here from you. Um, that being said, if you feel as though your points have been made and want to um, not take your place in the line, that's certainly your prerogative. We have received hundreds of emails to just to demonstrate how important these issues are to our community. You, we could not underscore that enough that these issues are vital and we hear you as a board, we've read them, we'll listen to you tonight as long as it takes. But that being said, in the interest of time, and we do have a report after this uh, that deals with the reopening of schools, which is also extremely important <laughs> given this intense time in our history that we are living in. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Hio to gracefully manage about 100 speakers um, who have requested to speak on this agenda item, which is a resolution 
related to Black Lives Matter. Thank you, President Caps. Yes, we have um, 87 um, requests to speak for this item. So I will go ahead and begin with Walid Afifi. And one moment. Can Thank you. you. Okay, go Thank ahead. Thank you. Um, first, I want to acknowledge and appreciate the power and resilience of our Black community and our communities of color, especially that of the youth. I raise their voice. I'm a professor in the Department of Communication at UCSB and parent of two children in the school district. I've been working in K-12 spaces the past few years to empower voices of color. Those experiences and others that I've had have made it abundantly clear that it is suffocating to live as a person of color in this community. Every single school board throughout our history is complicit in that reality. On to the demands um, of the youth. Two years and three months ago, when you were considering an SRO for San Marcos, I shared with you a report about summarizing evidence of the negative impact of SROs against students of color. The evidence is clear. The voices of the black and brown youth in our community were clear in their opposition. Yet those voices were ignored then, as they have been for years. So here we are again. Some of you started with a commitment to change. We're tired of words. They have been empty for decades. The primary question I have is, where have you been? Why has it taken youth to do the job? Why did it take youth years of working leading ethnic studies now with impact on time, families, mental health, and well-being for something the board should have taken on its own to create a requirement for Pretty one high. single course that explicitly acknowledged the impact of ethnicity broadly defined, one course. The youth are demanding that you declare racism as a public health emergency. Why did black youth have to demand this? Have you had sufficient conversations with, had you had sufficient conversations with our youth? This would have been clear years ago. In fact, 20 years ago, the American Public Health Association released a report showing the ways in which racism has dramatically affected public health. That was 20 years ago. Since then, hundreds of studies and reports have followed this, followed up. This is not controversial. School board members noted that George, Mur uh, George Floyd murder has woken them up. Our entire history is one of violence against the black community. We are founded on violence against the black community. Violence against people of color defines who we are as a nation. Thank you for your time. time. This for the school board to wake up. I support the demands of the youth in their entirety. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have Dylan Griffith. Hi, Dylan, you may begin. Awesome, thank you. You know, so I appreciate the words of uh, many of the board members who uh, strive to value the black student voices that put forth these urgently necessary demands. I'm disappointed that the board did not pass a motion to include at the very least a discussion of the demands today. Uh, I understand that the reallocation of funds takes time and practice, but the community wants to hear now where the board stands on these issues. The resolution regarding Black Lives Matter in schools is important and long overdue, yet it also doesn't reflect the demands of the black students that uh, the board strives to value. Uh, I support all the demands made by black students as presented today by Talia. Thank you for doing so. And lastly, the resolution on today's agenda specifies that the Black Lives Matter in school will take place in 2021 and contains no information on how black students will be supported in the immediate nor the long term. This temporary band-aid does not show long-term dedication to the safety, health, well-being, and academic excellence of black students. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Kelly Whaling. I just want to clarify again, um, not to speak to the content, but just that the agendas are set on Friday before the Tuesday meeting, just to respond to the, 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 the timing and sequences of responding to demands. I think it's important for everyone to understand. OK. Go ahead. Can, sorry, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at UC Santa Barbara um, and a mental health professional. And um, I just wanted to sort of echo Wally's words um, and say as a mental health professional, I see and I understand the ways in which schools, mental health systems, child welfare and juvenile justice criminalize our black and brown youth. It is our duty to dismantle these systems. We need counselors, teachers and administrators that can recognize how their actions contribute to the school to prison pipeline and the mass incarceration of people of color. Um, and most importantly, and most disappointingly, we need to listen to what the youth say. And I know that we keep saying, oh, well, um, you know, because of the Brown Act, this, we, we can't talk about these demands. But the fact that there was something 
to even talk about, which was just creating a Black Lives Matter Week, Black Lives Matter Week, I feel like that just shows kind of how tone deaf like we all are as adults listening to these youth, like it's not even remotely similar to what their demands were. Um, so that I just find that really disappointing. And I just wanted to say thank you, Talia, for your leadership um, and your demands. And um, I just hope that we can be closer. I support all of the demands and just hope that we can, um, you know, be closer to what the youth actually require and what they actually need to end the mass incarceration of folks of color rather than what just looks good or sounds good. Thank you. Next, we have Lindsay Helmick. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I just want to say I fully support the list of demands requested by these courageous students. Uh, their demands are reasonable and they're telling as to what we are currently doing is not working for them. While it is unfortunate that they have to be the ones demanding this, I did read the resolution and there are some being met or some being discussed. And so it is clear that their changes are in process. I implore you to continue working with these students and listening to them to take further action to keep the children safe and to get them more involved. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next we have Jenny Sperling. Go ahead. You can begin. Firstly, Ms. Ford and Ms. Reed, please recognize that your initial comments to Talia acknowledging how articulate she was. And Ms. Caps, your call to the eloquence of the demands are microaggressions and acts of racial injustice and anti-blackness. Black Lives Matter at school week. As an educator, I wonder if this is an oxymoron. When have black lives ever been safe in schools? Also, what message does it send to black youth and families for the other 51 weeks of the year? With school board members filled with expertise and training, bachelor's degrees and masters, and just on top of the learning and teaching in this community that I believe is more credible than anything an advanced degree can prove. I assume that as a board together, you would know that creating and naming a holiday week in this way is an act of violence that upholds white supremacy that the institution of K through 12 public education was initially founded upon. Youth organizers Shakir and Talia organized an incredibly beautiful protest and they demanded change, but instead you took their words and you pushed them aside. You treated, our, you treated our community youth voices and ideas as if their demands did not have value and are not worth your time or effort by not holding time for discussion today about actions for the current moment. When will those conversations start regarding their demands about mental health, about the school to prison pipeline and defunding contracts with SBPD? But this sort of pushing aside is not unfamiliar. We see the ways minority students are pushed into untraditional or alternative school spaces like La Cuesta, La Cuesta, Quetzal, or Los Prietos. And more recently, the way the districts has pushed aside the racist, hate-driven social media posts. Hi. Thank you. Next, we have Meg Boyer. Meg, go ahead. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you for your time. My name is Meg Boyer. I'm a counseling psychology doctoral student at UCSB. Um, as a therapist in training, I've worked with college students at both UCSB and Santa Barbara City College, and I've seen firsthand the psychological impact of a childhood and young adulthood shaped by racial trauma in this community. I believe our youth know best what actions will bring about racial justice in our schools and in our community, and for that reason, I'm in full support of all of their demands. Thank you for your time. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you so much. Next, we have Crystal Farmer. Crystal, you, you may begin. Hello. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to Talia and Shakir. They did a wonderful job. I also want to thank you, say thank you to Rose, Wendy, and Jackie for actually commenting, commenting back to her. I think that's important, y'all, when we have youth participation, that we need to honor that and listen to their voices. Um, they had wonderful demands. I think that going forward, it needs, they need to be heard and listened to. Jackie, I like the comment that you made about student advocacy and being part of shared governance. That's very important because you're only gonna know how to do for them if you include them in the decisions that you're making, right? And then as far as the resolution, um, it's really disappointing that you want to have a Black Lives Matter week during what's already supposed to be Black History Month where Black voices and experiences should already be honored. If you wanna do a Black Lives Matter week, do it in another month. 
so that black students and black experiences can be um, 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 respected year round. Um, I really hope that you take up the students' demands. I really hope that you listen to them. I really hope that you value them. I grew up in the, this school district and it's really sad to see that it hasn't changed very much. We need diversity. We need to listen to the youth. They know what they want. They're smart and they know how to lead. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Megan Peterson. Hello. Go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Megan Peterson and I'm an academic advisor at UC Santa Barbara. I encourage you to adopt the demands which the youth have already laid out to you and I've already emailed all of you this morning. Um, I also want to say that I'm incredibly uncomfortable and disappointed by your use of articulate. Um, it's absolutely a microaggression and, and you need to look at that. Um, and I want to address the people that spoke earlier um the other public comment i'm absolutely appalled that those are citizens of this county and have a say in the education of students um students are coming to ucsd and universities across the world incredibly are intelligent and incredibly racist so we absolutely need to use the just communities um program and be educating these students on racism and the the built white supremacy that we're currently living in. Um, and yeah, the, the, you need to divest from the police and thank you. Thank you. Next we have, um, trying to find. Carrie Hutchinson. Carrie, go ahead. Thank you, good evening. On October 22nd, 2019, the following letter was sent by the organization showing up for racial justice to the principal of a local high school in the district, and all of you were copied. I'm sharing it again with you tonight as a reminder that the student demands for culturally competent teachers are in response to real and chronic problems in our school district, and I urge you to meet these demands. The 2019 letter was entitled, Request to Discontinue Hateful Language as a Teaching Tool, and here is part of what the letter said. This letter is based on several complaints from students and parents about harm occurring in the classrooms on your campus. Within the past few weeks in class discussions around an assigned text, a white teacher curated several short paragraphs to read aloud to the class, all of which provided license for him to read the full N-word multiple times. One selection in particular included the N-word no less than seven times. If there was any attempt at a teaching moment, it was delivered ineffectively and did not at all mitigate the impact, especially on the few black students in his class. In fact, the complaints made to our group by students of various races explained that the repetitive use of the word was so shocking and unnecessary that it distracted several students from learning for the rest of the day. This letter is to request that you ask all teachers at your school to refrain from using the N-word in their classrooms. We also ask that you rethink the selection of required texts for your freshman English classes and all of your classes from a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sincerely, showing up for racial justice, Santa Barbara. <clears throat> As you can see from this letter, the problem of non-inclusion and cultural incompetency in our schools is real. We ask that you commit to working to address this problem immediately Fine. by meeting the demands of these student leaders. Thank you. Fine. Thank you. Next, we have Roxana Corona. Roxana, go ahead. Hi, I'm here in support. Um, I'm here in support of the demands of the youth has presented to you. Um, I want to be touching on the ethnic study courses with culturally relevant curriculum. And in, in these days, Instagram is a new textbook, except we're learning about systemic racism we haven't learned in school. The fact that I learned about this, this on a social media platform rather than school says a lot about our education system. It's clear that the education system teaches lies, not history, when descendants of colonizers call people illegal on stolen land. The only thing I've learned is that you can destroy an entire population of people and continue to marginalize them while still justifying their genocide. I had to wait until college to, to be taught about the civil rights movement in depth instead of briefly going on it in just a chapter in high school. And that shouldn't be the case. Why is it that all in, that was ingrained in my head was Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492? Not teaching students about the historic... Mm -hmm. 
Black, Indigenous, and other people of color have faced as a result of colonialism is a conscientious erasure of history that benefits the government, therefore upholding white supremacy. Ethnic studies should have been implemented a long time ago, and we as a community have a right to be educated on what has been hidden from us. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jordan Hirsch. One moment, I'm trying to unmute. Jordan, can you hear us? Can you unmute? Okay, he's not responding. Um, so we're gonna go to the next person. Um, Julio. Oh, he's not there either. Sorry. Clarissa Esros. Hi, yes. My name is Clarissa Ersos and I'm a Santa Barbara resident. And I'm here to give my full support uh, to the demands of the youth. I wholeheartedly echo and support all of their demands of Talia Shakir and the rest of the high schoolers, specifically black high schoolers, taking the lead on this. Um, I'd like to call out extra and explicit support, though, for ending the contract that the school district has with the Santa Barbara Police Department and the County Sheriff's Department. Considering that law enforcement here in this city have not historically and do not currently protect or serve our black students or other students of color, the SBUSD needs to terminate their contract with the police department and the county sheriff's department. And I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for the next person available because I think they're leaving, so one moment. Next, we have Olivia Dabby. Go ahead, Olivia. Thank you. As a member of the Santa Barbara community, I just wanna say I stand in support of all the youth's demands. As educators, your trusted leaders, mentors, and role models to our community students who will grow up to be the next generation of Americans, it is your responsibility to teach and lead by example. Talks about race can be challenging, but we must turn this silence into dialogue. These conversations are not just for students of color, but for students in predominantly white schools too, which Santa Barbara certainly is. You are responsible for teaching our students to build their capacity to understand and confront racism, as well as contribute to a society where peace and justice prevail. I urge you to provide the ethnic studies classes with culturally relevant curriculum and implement hiring practices to bring in competent teachers of color to teach on these courses. I yield the rest of my time, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Amara T. Go ahead, Amara. Hi there, everyone. Um, I think what we're seeing is that these conversations are way, way overdue. These students have brought forth something that everyone has known has been happening for a long time now. As a parent, it was really disheartening to hear that you guys are proposing a Black Lives Matter week in a month that already has 28 days dedicated to Black history. That is ridiculous and truly insulting. They want action. They want change and I urge you to re-examine the request they put forth to you. They know that they are not seen and heard in their schools. They do not see themselves there. I grew up in Santa Barbara. My parents grew up in Santa Barbara as Black community members. It's a problem that we have all been pushing aside, and they have finally, finally brought it to your attention and brought people with them to support it. So like I said, and like other people have said, I really hope that you are truthful and dedicated to making these changes. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have July Longco. Hello, uh, my name is July Longcob. I am an incoming senior of San Marcos High School and a member of the regular student body, not ASB. And I would like to say that I'm in support of Shakir and Talia with their 
um, demands and the youth um, within the community with the demands stating to it and also um, for you guys to take consider in consideration of it and yeah um, I agree um, I agree with the how um, you guys have to, to do the um, the thing Friday before this meeting and yeah that's all I have to say thank you next we have Cameron Hatcher thank you Sandra my name is Cameron Hatcher Day and I'm an English language arts teacher at La Colina Junior High firstly I fully support our students each one of their demands and the Black Lives Matter movement I appreciate Ms. Capp's clarification in regard to the board agenda. Still, I would like to voice my concerns about the resolution on its own and a direction I worry our district has a tendency to lean. Aside from affirming actions and stances that SBUSD has already taken and introducing the idea of a Black Lives Matter week within Black History Month, the resolution on today's agenda only affirms what all students deserve without acknowledging and addressing that the very students the march was meant to amplify and protect are Black students have specifically when SBUSD not received what they deserve. We have a tendency as a district, seen even at the start of this meeting, to congratulate ourselves for what we've already accomplished more than we are willing to take further necessary action. When the district does respond to our students' demands, the district response should not be, oh, we already do that, or oh, we have a better idea. 30 we seconds. Critically examine how our past efforts to address the inequity experienced by our Black students have been implemented determine whether or not these efforts have been effective and then add more interventions where necessary. The students have already done this work for us and their demands offer us an essential framework for this implementation cycle. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Next we have Elena Moran. Go ahead, Thank you so much. My name is Lena Moran, I'm Director of Programming and Language Justice for Just Communities. And at Just Communities, we wholeheartedly believe in student voices and in student-led movements. We saw that this weekend as our youth organized March and presented their demands to the school district. And now more than ever, it is imperative that they are heard and their demands are met. In regards to the resolution item F1, having a week where the district focuses on the history, reality, and needs of a specific identity group is clearly not embraced. The district must make sure the African-American Black experience and identity is not only celebrated and highlighted during one week, but it must be woven into every aspect of the curriculum throughout the school year. Additionally, Black students, Black families, and Black educators should be visible and embraced every single day, every single week of the school year, not just one week in February. The demands the students put forth are all in line with the equity cultural proficiency work that the district has committed to for years the ethnic studies initiative that has been passed, and even the META initiative, as Dr. As Master, Mr. Mastroka said. Tonight's agenda includes only some of these demands, as you said, and clearly not enough. On behalf of Just Communities, we strongly urge the district to move forward all of these demands, and we urge you to continue to engage in this dialogue with a sense of urgency, and always, always include African-American Black students, families, and educators fully in every step of the process. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Barbara Parme. Hello. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm asking you to meet Black student demands. Good intentions are not enough. Right now, tonight, in this meeting, in this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, you can at least indicate your support for hiring teachers that not only externally mirror the faces of their students, but also internally mirror the struggles and fears of white dominance that black and brown students carry every day of their lives. If you do not do this, you will be remembered as being on the wrong side of history. The time is now. The board must rise up to meet all these demands. Funding at-risk youth, restorative justice, and ethnic studies, as well as deep funding in the police will be the true markers of your actions. Good intentions are not enough. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Morgan Fredericks. Hi, yes, thank you for um, allowing me to speak tonight. I, um, addressing agenda item F1, 
uh, when I read this agenda item, I felt confused and extremely upset. Um, either the committee did not read the demands made by the students or they are deliberately choosing to ignore them. Regardless of which is true, both are equally unacceptable responses to the outcry from the student body. How dare you try to ignore and silence these students who are asking for your help and support? How dare you propose a resolution that clearly does not include any of the specific demands made? If you are not equipped to assist the students with the demands, I expect you to put somebody in charge who is. Um, I just want to say that I am fully in support of all of the demands as somebody, as a young person and a psychology student and somebody who's recovered from addiction and an eating disorder, um, specifically this demand about allocating funds to rehabilitation and mental health services is extremely important, but every single demand needs to be addressed. Um, and I hope that you loop in the students okay. with the time to write these out for you. Um, their voices need to be heard and they need to be included in this process as well. I yield my time, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Evan Asher. Thank you, my name is Evan Asher. I'm a local small business owner here and I have a six-year-old who's in the school system. And I just wanted to uh, lend my voice um, to centering and supporting the demands of the black students who've given actually a gift to you in the form of their demands as a very first step in guidance towards what is needed. And I uh, am uh, aware that it is a difficult position you're in to balance the needs of all the various parents who are putting pressure on uh, our most precious things in our lives, which are our children, but we're trusting you to make the right decision to see the uh, emotion and uh, outcry um, that you're seeing right now nationally and internationally to understand uh, what the right thing to do here is. So I uh, urge you to not only listen to the demands that are being presented to you, but to uh, innovate ways that you can prevent uh, such things are happening in the future by um, listening more. Uh, and I will yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Mary O'Connor. Hi there. Go ahead. Uh, I'd also like to thank Talia, Shakir, as well as Ms. Sims, Milton, and any other uh, Black um, members of the community who have joined in on this, I am going to use um, your words to try to help teach you. Um, when you put out this resolution, it said, this resolution is a response to both current and historically disparate treatment of African Americans. By, and then you said, you declaring February 2nd through 5th as Black Lives Matter in Schools Week. To me, that implies Santa Barbara believes that black students matter one week out of the year. I think it's completely insulting that you disregarded the hard work, reasonable and necessary six demands that the actual students made. Um, so the fact that you majority white board had the audacity to believe that declaring five days out of the school year as Black Lives Matter was making real change, if the district and board can't be bothered to do more, then dedicate a week of Black History Month, then you should probably consider another form of employment because this isn't it. I Good. yield my time. Thank you. Next we have Sarah Henderson. Hello? Go ahead. Hi. Uh, I would also like to voice my support for the comprehensive demands presented to the district. As a former student of the Santa Barbara Unified School District, I feel confident in saying you can do better. And having just one vague week has been shown over and over again to not be enough. Uh, one example at BP uh, is the fact that the student resource officer is also the varsity baseball coach which enmeshes the law enforcement within the culture of the school and makes someone who to many students is a threatening presence, a mentor to some of their peers, many of whom are privileged. This dynamic can only strengthen the idea that law enforcement is a welcome presence at, on the schools, which is obviously false as the demands and many students have voiced. 
This is just one example of how the district has yet to meet the, the needs and demands of black and non-black students of color. And I am, implore you to critically examine the current policies and make the necessary changes to ensure that they are and have a voice and representation in these schools. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Chelsea Steele. Um, one moment. Chelsea, can you unmute yourself? I'm not able to do it. Hmm. Not able to unmute Chelsea. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and go to the next person. Next, we have Sarah Cunningham. Go ahead, Sarah. Hello, this is Sarah Cunningham. I'm calling today in support of our youth and support all of the demands that they've made and urge you to adopt them as soon as possible. I'm concerned that we um, are not doing enough to address the systemic racism embedded in our schools and ask that you take every action that the students have shown us that we need in order to remedy this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one moment. I'm looking who else is online. Um, next, we have Aubrey Catanese. Aubrey, are you there? Mm, I don't think she's. Aubrey, are you there? Can you hear us? Can you unmute? No, I'm going to go to the next person. Um, next, we have Sochi Munoz. Sochi, are you there? Um, Hi, I'm here, oh. but I didn't re um, ask to speak, so you can skip over me. Go ahead. Oh, I didn't ask to speak. You can keep going. Oh, okay. Thank you. You were on my list. <laughs> Sorry about that board. One moment. Next we have, oops, Kyla. Kyla Gully. Hmm. Kyla, can you hear us? Can you unmute? Hello? Go ahead. Hi there. Members of the board, my name is Kayla Galley and I've been a member of this community for over 10 years and I intend to raise my future children here in Santa Barbara. I'm speaking up in support of Black Lives Matter and the students who on Sunday marched against injustice. I stand with the students in support of their very reasonable demands. This generation of young people deserve better than just a Black Lives Matter week, especially one that's scheduled for a month already dedicated to Black history. That's not enough. We have a lot of ground to cover over the centuries of discrimination. The blood of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, are too, and too many more names to mention is crying out in the form of protester chants in all 50 states. 
we need to all deconstruct our attitudes, practices, behaviors, and policies and analyze each and every one of them under the lens of racism and discrimination. It's up to us to take actionable steps to move forward and empower these students to become our next generation of leaders. I do wanna acknowledge the work that the board is doing to incorporate ethnic studies, mm -hmm. but there is so much more that the students are demanding that to, uh, to take action on. Someone in the board needs to step up to get this list of student demands added to the very next agenda. They deserve a timely response to their asks. We have sat collectively by and done nothing for too long. We know that racism exists and each and every one of us needs to do our part to confront it, condemn it, especially in our school systems and in doing so prepare this next generation to build something better. Make up a commitment to put the student demands on the next agenda for discussion. Thank you. Fine, thank you. Next we have Jennifer Hale. Hello. Jennifer, go ahead. Hi, thank you. As a parent, I'm here to wholeheartedly support the demands of our Black youth leaders. I sent an email yesterday stating my support, and the response that I received was a list of what the district has already done to promote equity. And while I appreciate these efforts, what I had really hoped to hear was simply, one, you are listening and actively engaging with these Black youth leaders, and two, you will be acting on their demands. Having racism on the radar and implementing a few programs around it is simply not enough. Your Black students have done the work for you and provided a very clear roadmap to equity and inclusion. This is your call to action and it couldn't be more urgent. We have a hate group in Santa Barbara that has been coming to these meetings. They're here tonight with their unfair education tactics of questioning cultural proficiency speaking out against just communities and ethnic studies, and making outrageous claims about racism against white staff and students. So please, use your power, listen to the Black youth leaders, meet their demands, mm -hmm. and build a district culture mm -hmm. where action and equity go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Anna Garcia. Go ahead, Anna. Hi, um, I'm actually at a loss for words. I'm not even sure how to address, how to begin to address what I've heard tonight. Um, this is my first time at a board meeting and I wanna amplify what the woman before me just said about the hate and the hate group that was spoken before, um, talking about all of the harm that that type of language and parts on our students and how it impacts um, the way that they develop as so many of the mental health folks who spoke before this also addressed. Listen to the students. They've told you exactly what they want. I understand that you're using the excuse of I haven't met with the students. Um, we didn't hear the voices. It's time to stand up against them. Not the students, I'm sorry, against the hate group that spoke in the beginning. I yield my time. Thank you. Next we have Christian Alonso. Go ahead, Christian. Good evening, board members, and thanks so much for your time. My name is Christian Alonso, and I'm the president of the Santa Barbara Young Democrats. I know this is unrelated to the agenda item, but like many tonight, I'm here voicing my support for our courageous Black students and their demands. While I don't have any children in the school district, I am deeply concerned about the safety of our students, faculty, and board members. For all of the white people who have never been to a school board meeting, I want you to hear this. A group of white supremacists consistently show up to these meetings, Goleta Unified and at Santa Barbara City College, and they call themselves Fair Education SB. <clears throat> you've, heard, you've heard from many of them tonight. It may be shocking to many of you white people listening, but these people show up to every meeting and say the horrible things you all heard them say tonight. They are responsible for several lawsuits with Santa Barbara Unified in opposition to anti-racist services and ethnic studies curriculum being provided to our schools. We're not gonna let Fair Education SB get away with what they're trying to do. We're not gonna allow any of them to be elected to the school board, and we won't tolerate their racist and harmful rhetoric in our schools and at these meetings. So to all the righteous white folks commenting tonight, where the hell have you been? Please don't let this be your last education board meeting in our community. We need your help. Thank you, I yield my time. 
Thank you. Next we have Alice Freire. Freire. Sorry if I mispronounce your name, last name. Go ahead. That's right. Alice Freire. Thank you. Um, obviously, I'd like to support, uh, voice my support so fully for Shakira and Talia and the youth of SB. They're doing amazing things and their demands are very, very important. And I'd like to speak on this agenda item. I believe that the students of the SB Unified School District deserve a lot better. So by simply proposing a Black Lives Matter week during Black History Month is quite weak and shows that you are only here to do the bare minimum for the students here. It shows that you do not care about them, especially the Black students who deserve so much more respect than is given to them. And it also shows that you have not listened to the demands made by the youth of SB. Why are you so disinclined to listen to them, to not listen to them and respect them? In particular, I'd like to speak on the demand of ethnic studies classes with culturally relevant curriculum. When I was in high school, graduated in 2019, I feel so disappointed that I did not receive an adequate or extensive education on black history or black excellence. I learned about the civil rights movement a little bit and about okay. slavery, but the black existence is so much more than just their oppression. Students should be taught all aspects of ethnic studies from people of color and black history and ethnic studies should be part of every class and curriculum. So if you want to do right by the students of your school district, listen to them and take action on their demands. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ashley Aragon. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Ashley Aragon and I'm a Santa Barbara resident. I'm here today because Young Black Lives Matter and I want to voice my support and the need for the school district to address the demands specified by our young people of color, not just during the board comments portion, but in the agenda, and not just during this meeting, but in meetings going forward, and not with a tone deaf decision to enact a Black Lives Matters week during a month already dedicated to black history. Because it is not just three police officers that refuse to kneel and make students of color live in fear in this city. During the May 31st Black Lives Matters protest, every officer and our mayor refused to kneel in support of people of color. The SB Unified motto is every child, every chance, every day. And this is a chance for the school district to listen to what these children and young adults are telling us what they need in their daily lives in regard to their education and quality of life. And this is a chance for our community to continue to attend these board events and have a voice. And I urge this board to actively address these specific demands from our students of color, demands which Talia has and include these students in conversations going forward. The last thing I'd like to say is I would also like to echo the fact that there were a lot of microaggressions when Talia had her speech. And I would like to say that there does need to be a lot of education within the board itself. And I highly encourage all of you to uh, educate yourselves on microaggressions. I yield my time. Thank you. Next we have Katia Tashma. Hi, um, I'm here also to back up the youth of Santa Barbara. I know they deserve better and I know that not, I know some of you are trying, but I know a lot of you are not and have not been trying to raise the people of color in our community, the youth. And I went through the school district, the school system, I've grown up here. I attended Lacumba Junior High and Santa Barbara High School. I'm a mixed race student and I felt when certain teachers and administrators saw me as white or Latina, I bore witness to how differently I was treated by teachers on the basis of how I looked and who was surrounding me. And I can't emphasize enough that I, how often I saw my Latinx friends get targeted for the basis of their race, often given punishments and never were they given the right to speak? How can we expect our students of color to stay committed to a school system that is not committed to them? That in fact, that in fact constantly erases their history and punishes them when what they need is to be heard and listened to. The school district must cut ties with the SPPD and the sheriff's office. Black and brown indigenous history must be tied into the curriculum for all students. Anything less is cultural genocide. The school district I ask that the Santa Barbara School District put healing and humanity above sustaining this oppressive status quo. And please don't be afraid of just like change because it, we need it, we need it. The students need it and the kids need it. And if you're not doing it, I, I don't know. Time, thank you. Next we have 
um, Shalon Edwards. Hello, thank you for your work, Matya. And um, first, thank you to Superintendent Natsuoka. I'm a teacher, fifth grade teacher at Santa Barbara Charter School, and I've been continually impressed by your leadership, particularly by how you stood behind the work of just communities. Um, and thank you, I'm encouraged by the words and sentiments of this board. Thank you to everyone who's spoken. Um, I especially honor the work behind the youth demands for social justice. It's so important to give our youth this voice as they go through their lives. They will continue this voice and hopefully in college and for future acts of justice and advancement toward the just and raise the socially and racially just world that we're strive, striving for. Um, my demands or my requests are that we look more into the um, culturally relevant ethics studies, embedding it throughout the years, K through 12, embedding it throughout the year also, August through June, not just in a week or in a month, taking the onus off the teachers to, to meet effectively this curriculum in a meaningful and relevant way by putting this into the social studies state standards. Also, I'd like to just suggest, address the restorative okay. justice practices and our commitment to that to look at what is working, what is not working, and how we can do better to address that and to improve our restorative justice practice, our conflict resolution throughout our school district, and to reappropriate the funds from our police services on school campuses toward that means. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your work. Thank you. Next, we have Jenny Sperling. Well, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I, I already spoke. Thank you, though. Oh, thank you. Uh, one moment, I'm going to um, see the next person. So next we have Sarah Ballers. Hi. At the time of reading this, 53 teachers from our site have signed on to the following statement, and one did not. The teachers and staff of San Marcos High School want to publicly declare our support and pride for our students who led and participated in the Black Lives Matter March and demonstration on June 7th, and for all those who continue to stand for racial equity and social justice. Our calling as educators demands that we speak out in solidarity against the disproportional brutality and violence Black Americans experience in our nation because of systemic racism and white supremacy. Our teachers and staff commit to recognizing racial bias and, further diff and furthering difficult conversations around race in order to advance the process of healing. As educators, parents, and community members, we hear our students' demands and we stand in support of them. We call on the school board members to commit funding, commit to funding restorative justice and mental Where? health programs and transparency with the SB County Sheriff's Department and Santa Barbara Police Department's role on campus. Advancing culturally responsive curriculum, establishing more equitable hiring practices, condemning the school to prison pipeline, and ultimately, we call on the school board to continue to listen and act in support of our students' needs. We have the utmost respect and gratitude for our students who have brought these demands forward. The strength of our demands is a direct result of their organization. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Marcus. Thanks. Next, we have Charles Petkovich. Charles, are you there? Go ahead, Charles. Hello, can you hear us, Charles? I'm not able to hear. Charles, are you there? Okay, I'm gonna move to the next person. Um, one moment. Wait, 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 no. Oh, okay. <laughs> there he is. Wait, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, I'd like to comment in support of the, the, the Black youth leaders' uh, demands, of course, and uh, particularly the, the two pertaining to the prison pipeline, uh, one being the, the acknowledgement and recognition and condemnation of the prison pipeline, 
uh, uh, school to prison pipeline uh, that exists in, in this country and you know, even in this district. Uh, I think it's important for the education uh, the board to recognize this because not only does it give the students uh, the knowledge of this, the, the awareness of this, of this system, that uh, the systematic tool of oppression that leads to so many incarcerations of people who, who could have lived a different life uh, just because that's what the that's what the system dictates. Uh, I'd also like to say that police officers don't belong on the, stu the school. Police exist to protect property and keeping them there is just uh, a, an intimidation tactic to people of color and a way to keep the white Very students funny. and students of privilege uh, feeling happy and safe. I understand that y you couldn't make any resolutions to these th uh, these demands for this meeting, but if there aren't any resolution, if these demands aren't met by next meeting, I think that uh, many many constituents will re be reevaluating their dis decision on who the board members of their students should be of their kids. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Moni Dewitt. Moni, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? I'm not able to do it. Moni, are you there? I'm trying. Hello? There you go. Yeah. Go oh, am I on? Okay, sorry. You're doing such a good job, Sandra. Okay, yeah, I'm very excited to speak about the school to prison pipeline. You know, the, the sad thing is, is that it affects um, blacks and Latinx the most. And um, across the United States, 85% of the juveniles who interact with our court system are functionally illiterate. So we need to do more about literacy. And in our own community, if you look at La Cuesta, the CAP scores, only 8%, and these are juniors and seniors, are meeting the literacy standard. Okay? La Cuesta, that's terrible. Yeah, um, Harding, 9%, you know? Only, actually, uh, La Cuesta is only 4%. And Montecito Union, surprisingly, 90% meet the standards in the fourth grade, and that's a mix of people. So the point is, you're not spending the money in the right places. And I remember you pull money out, 1.8 million out of special ed. You know, the money's flying out of special ed. The meta program got passed without even having a budget. So I'm here to say, let's get back to literacy, get rid of Lucy Calkins. And let's focus on the dyslexics, the neurodiverse, anybody struggling with literacy. You know, we need interventions that are appropriate like the kids in private schools get. And I, I've been talking about this for ages. The school to prison pipeline is real. I've met the students, the juveniles up at Los Prietos. Those are wonderful people who you failed by not giving an appropriate education. If you can't read by the end of the third grade, you are so much more likely to drop out. And that's where truancy and the educational system goes to the juvenile justice system. And Mr. Matsuyoko, I wish you would have found your will and capacity to do something about it because people at Harding were at 9% through your whole time. I mean, that's Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. And next we have Peggy Ochoa. Hello, everybody, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Peggy Ochoa. I am a an SB Unified staff, parent, and former student of San Marcos High School. Notice I said former student and not alumni. That's because I was a struggling student who was eventually pushed out. But that's not the sad part because this isn't about me. The sad part is that 20 years later, the school system is continuing to push out students. Now I work at San Marcos High School and I've had two sons finally make it through and graduate but it was definitely a challenge and I worked there. Imagine the parents who don't have access to the supports or resources that I was able to fight for. Their kids have no hope. We need more interventions put in place besides suspensions before truancy DA, probation and juvenile court system swallows them up. Some suggestions could be perhaps bringing back YSS, creating a mentor program for struggling youth, but most importantly, making IEE mandatory for all teachers. All students do deserve justice, equity, and freedom, but declaring only one week 
of Black Lives Matter is not enough. How about the entire school year? How about that? Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Will Howard. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm a Santa Barbara High alumnus and an educator. I fully support all demands that Talia laid out at the beginning of this session. I think that the action item you put forward for this meeting is an insult to the student organizers and all black students and students of color in the district. Um, earlier, Jenny Sperling pointed out, and since then others have pointed out, the microaggressions that a few of the board members made toward Talia. I also encourage you to interrogate your coded comments about her quote unquote eloquence. I also wanna say that as an SB voter, I know that most of the board members will be up for reelection in December. I will absolutely not vote for you if you don't meet all the students' demands. Do the right thing. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. Next we have Rocio Pacheco. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, good evening. My name is Rocio Pacheco Garcia and I am in support of the demands of the students. I myself was a student of the district, graduated in 2013. I began working as a paraeducator at Santa Barbara High School and now have the pleasure of working with their families and family engagement. I wanted to share an experience I had as a paraeducator at Santa Barbara High School working with one of our most vulnerable populations, that of English learners, which you are unlikely to hear from at most of these board meetings. The students I worked with trusted me and often asked me questions. I specifically recall them asking me with concern about what the police on campus could and could not do to them. I remember explaining to them their rights and trying to reassure them that on campus they should be safer. Although I was not entirely confident with my response. Regardless of how friendly or hardworking they may claim to be, the very sight of a police officer on campus is not an inviting or safe presence to our students. Our students are tell telling us clearly that they would like the district to def defund contracts with the sheriff and police department, and I think we should listen to them. The pandemic and series of social injustices are difficult for most grown adults to process and understand. I cannot imagine the stress and trauma that that our students have been through, especially students of color. Our students are asking for our help. They are asking for their schools to be a place that sees them, hears them, and values them. They are asking for this to be reflected in their curriculum, resources, hiring practice, and decision-making. I understand there are challenges, but okay. I trust and hope you will not let this opportunity go by. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Haley Silva. Hello? Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read this statement on behalf of La Colina teachers. Um, the teachers and staff of La Colina Junior High publicly declare our support for our students, former and current, who lead and participate in the Black Lives Matter march and demonstration. In our classes, we attempt to teach each of our students that their voice has value. We attempt to empower students to speak on issues and societal importance. Here we see that our students have spoken. We feel immense pride for the way that our students use their voices to advocate for positive change in our community. Our teachers and staff pledge that we will work to recognize our own racial biases, and we will continue to engage in conversations and work around race and racism in order to advance the process of healing. As a school community, we hear our students' demands and we stand in firm support of them. We implore our school board members to show our students that we have their voices by accepting these demands to foster safer and more inclusive school communities. To simply point out that the work we have already done is not sufficient. We must continue to move forward using the student demands as our new foundation. Again, I would like to thank our students for their leadership in this conversation and around anti-blackness and equity in our school communities. We look forward to our role as partners in this work. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Colette Selstra. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, I want to uh, state how important it is to allocate funds for rehabilitation and mental health services as an alternative to pro probation and juvie for at-risk students, especially that we should publicly condemn the prison pipeline 
um, by not supporting, you're robbing our at-risk students of opportunities because once they have that permanent mark on their record, it's practically impossible to break that ceiling. That mark is a stain that follows you, restricting job availability, higher education opportunities, and so much more. Why not choose a different approach that instead of punishing a child with no control of the current mental or environmental situations they face, give them the opportunity to help them grow and show that they have support. It is so important to, in other words, it is so important to provide ethnic studies. By refusing to provide ethnic studies um, and equitable hiring practices of teachers of color, you are whitewashing the minds of our future generations. It makes a statement on how you are refusing to acknowledge that systemic racism is not only in our criminal justice system, but present in housing, public health, equity, hiring discrimination, education, and so much more. It's so important that we educate all students, all of them, on ethnic studies to draw awareness to our current system that has upholded ideals supporting white supremacies for centuries. Our youth has the opportunity to change how our current system operates, to learn from our country's dark history and strive onwards to uplift students of color, black and brown. Thank you, it's time. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Next, we have Kathleen Blue. Hi, I'm a teacher at Santa Barbara High School. I'm also a member of the Ethnic Studies cadre. I know there was enough time to add the demands to this week's agenda, but I'm still calling in support of the use demands. I know the district is meeting one of the demands by implementing ethnic studies, but it's important that we prioritize offering more ethnic studies courses as well as meet their explicit demands to hire culturally competent teachers of color to teach those courses. Currently, not all teachers who will teach ethnic studies are teachers of color. At Santa Barbara High, 60% of our students are students of color. However, most of the teachers are white. Students deserve to see themselves reflected by their teachers. In addition, I'd like to emphasize my support for students' demands um, for the district to publicly condemn the school to prison pipeline, as well as defunding contracts with Santa Barbara police and offering alternatives to punitive suspension in juvenile halls, such as mental health resources and restorative justice practices that go hand in hand. One of the speakers earlier, Teresa, cited from eddata.org that Santa Barbara has a 4.2% suspension rate, which might not sound like a lot, but if you compare it to another district that I worked in, LAUSD, it has a 0.7% suspension rate. LAUSD is not perfect, but they do implement restorative justice practices to really reduce the suspension rates. So I urge that you implement the use demands and ensure that Santa Barbara Unified is equitable to all students. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have um, our final speaker, uh, Rachel Beck. Hi, can y'all hear me? Yes, Rachel, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, on Sunday, I had the honor of marching in a Black Lives Matter protest organized by Santa Barbara High School students. The protest was not only peaceful, but filled with music, joy, hope, and education. Many people spoke and gave words of wisdom. For many of these young adults, these might be the first call, their first call to action, uh, inspired by a lifetime of witnessing systemic racism. Show them that their voice does matter and that you are listening. Please do not insult them with a week of Black Lives Matter. Please honor them with a promise of a better future. Their list of demands is simple. I fully echo and support their demands. I will not repeat them here. They have been stated very eloquently and very educationally by the students. You can find them online and I'm sure they've emailed them. Clearly the education is not needed on the student side. The board, as well as the older generations of America, need to commit to learning and frankly unlearning in order to move forward. I will reiterate the demand to publicly condemn the school to prison pipeline. This is something that you can at least start today. There is never a perfect place to start, but this is a place to start. I ask that you honor these students and the youth across America by committing to these policies or at the very least, least by discussing these demands at your very next meeting. Uh, show these students who are your children, our fellow citizens, and our future leaders that their voice is heard. Uh, there is nothing else on your agenda that could be so important. So please, I, I urge you to add all these policies to your list of uh, agenda type topics for your very next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. President Caps, that concludes our public comment on this item. Thank you to all of our speakers. 
we heard you clearly this action item is not one we'll move forward with in my opinion that's my suggestion to the board i'm going to turn it over to dr wagnick but this does this falls far short of what you deserve how we want to hear you and honor you and your future and the learning that we need to do as a board so i'm going to turn it over to dr wagnick um, and we'll have a conversation, but my recommendation is that we do take up all of these demands for our next meeting and re have a, a resolution and actions because intentions are one thing, but actions are another and have actions at the next meeting that reflect the demands. So I will turn it over to Dr. Wagnick. Thank you. Uh, good evening, um, Mr. Matsuoka, uh, President Caps, board members and a, a very good evening to all those who just spoke in favor of um, our youth and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I had the um, true honor of um, seeing the youth uh, at the district office on Sunday. And um, I'm reflecting on the fact that it's, uh, you know, the Brown Act that we have talked about does prevent us um, and, and put up timetables. However, there are ways um, we, do, we did have to adhere to that. However, tonight we do have a revised version of the resolution that um, Ms. Sims Moten is going to present in just a moment. But I do want to say um, that you have been heard. Um, as I said on Sunday, I'm trying to practice eyes and ears open and a little more mouth shut. Um, I think it is important for us as adults, we have a lot to learn from our youth. And um, I learned a lot both from the youth and the adults who spoke. Um, I know that intention, our intention, I know what our intentions were. However, the impact was different and it's the impact that matters. And so um, with that, mouth shut, and I will turn it over to Ms. Sims Moten. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wagnett and uh, President Capps and members of the board. Um, as much as I have been, you know, like I said, wor just words just couldn't come to describe you know, the feelings in the in and what has happened over the last, um, you know, few weeks and certainly before then. I want to be pre very transparent and want to be uh, a board that when we present something and if it's not where it's supposed to be, that we have, that we're listening very hard with you and that we hear what you're having to say. Uh, and so I think that's the case tonight. So I appreciate everyone that you said that called us out on what we need to do in a respectful way. And I think as we start tonight really is the start of a conversation that how do we go about uh, including our students more again about them and for them that we definitely need to have that. So I, I hear that very loud and clear and committed to, to, to doing so. And I was looking at something in, as uh, in my early uh, care and education as we're starting to look at things. And the last thing they said about racism was that when we're looking out to the community, we need to listen and we need to listen hard. We need to listen with humility and listen with a commitment to do better. And so I think that's what you're hearing from this board tonight. We're listening, we hear you and a commitment to do better. And that this is a start of that conversation where we're including you in the conversation and not just as a silent partner or just as we make the decision, but we together, meaning with you as well, how do we make those decisions? I will still read this resolution. We try to incorporate again and not get behind any process. Um, what we tried to do was um, initially was try to, you know, to respond to it, that we hear it and we know that there's something needs to be done and we need to be resolute in, in our language, right? And so then when the demands came later, I said, can we go back and revise and add, uh, you know, uh, some, some of the demands or the spirit of that? So even just trying to do that, it's not an excuse and not trying to make an excuse. I'm just being really real about, I have really heard this tonight and I'm, I'm happy to read it, but I know we need to re-edit and I'm looking forward to, you know, working with the students, how do we make it better? So 
I'm, I'm committing that that piece, but I want to read it and, and to, to let you know that the spirit of this, uh, you know, with regards to our intent was to respond and so that we hear and we did not appear tone deaf, but there is some tone deafness, you know, just hearing whatever you had to say. I co-authored this also with Ms. Ford. So again, in terms of what we're looking at, I'm going to read it and I, you know, we can more have a conversation, but certainly the great, the, 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 the voices have spoken as to what we need to do. So. Whereas we, we are always committed to justice and equity for all students, families, staff, and community members served by the Santa Barbara Unified School District. And whereas it is gravely important at this moment in time to declare that racism is a public health emergency and to affirm that we stand with black children, families, communities everywhere in the fight for racial, somebody just did something to me. Oh, screen did you share it with me? Okay. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. I was like, um, I'm trying to uh, mute it small in it so that I can still read it because it's, it's being, thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Where it is gravely important at this moment in time to declare that racism is a public health emergency and to affirm that we stand with black children, families, and communities everywhere in the fight for racial equality and against injustice. And whereas per board policy 5145.9, we do not tolerate hate or racism toward any group at any time, and thus are committed to creating meaningful dialogues on our campuses around issues of social justice and the root causes of institutional racism and racial strife, as well as allocating further resources for restorative justice and for other practices that end the school to prison pipeline. And whereas Santa Barbara Unified by no means is immune to incidents of racial injustice, we respond swiftly and thoughtfully when we encounter intolerance, inequity, and bias on our campuses with the goal of helping all students to grow and learn. And whereas Santa Barbara Unified is committed to, is committed to ongoing movement of critical reflection and honest conversation in school communities for all to engage with the issues of racial injustice. And whereas we must work together to address the structural racism that creates economic, educational, and social disparities. And whereas in response to both current and historical disparate treatment of African Americans, we assert that Black Lives Matter. And now there, therefore be it resolved. And this is where I really was really hearing what the students were saying and how do we how, know the things that we need to incorporate throughout this document to really reflect the voice of our students. Be it resolved that the Santa Barbara Unified Board of Trustees, one, endorses and encourages its staff and students to engage in the practice of equity in order to reject racism, build understanding, and stimulate active engagement in creating pathways to freedom and justice for all people at all times. Values, human rights, peace, respect, inclusivity, and equity, and recognize that we are strengthened in diversity. Declares and I hear you very clearly, this is something we can certainly take out, I will read what's in here, declares that February, two, February 2nd through the 5th, 2021, be, shall be recognized as Black Lives Matter at school, at school week to coincide with and augment Black History Month. This week will be designed to, in, to inspire, to explore, and to teach young people through lessons, discussions, art, and social action about structural racism, Black identity, and history, and grapple with the past, present and future status of black lives in our society and to affirm that the status of equal to and not secondary to the lives of others. And finally calls for educators across grade levels and content resources that are inclusive of all our diverse learners to deliver equitable anti-racist instruction throughout the whole year and not just one week or one month. So, so having said all of that, certainly, uh, the conversations that we've had, and I really want to say that conversation as we are building trust about we, we're hearing you and how are we going to incorporate what, what, uh, what your thoughts are, what your concerns are in, in terms of that. So in terms of being able to incorporate what we were hearing tonight, uh, I, I'm, I'm also supporting that we, we do some editing to the conversation that includes you so that when we present this resolution, it's resolved that it also includes your voices as well. So I, I want to also turn it over to Ms. Ford to, to add her comments as well. 
Oh, thanks. I, uh, I think tonight uh, has been a night of listening and I will, for the most part, leave it at that only to reinforce that it is important that as a board, we uh, create the discipline to listen to our community before we put something on an action item on the agenda. So I can't vote for this tonight. I, I hope the rest of my board agrees with that. I, I think we need to take it back to the drawing board and make it better. I, yes, Dr. Reed. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge um, and first apologize and take responsibility for expressing a microaggression earlier. And I, um, I want to acknowledge the hurt that I caused and would like to make amends for that statement. And I think really what I need to learn is to um, realize I need to listen more and with humility and to listen better. So uh, I'm gonna definitely work and move forward in that, in that respect. As an educator, one of our roles is to dismantle inequities and this is our work, this should be our work. And so we must be vigilant in promoting anti-racism. I think what I would just like to state about this resolution, I certainly can't um, agree to take action on it either. What I would like to say is that it's very clear that we need to really analyze and critically analyze the work that we are doing to disrupt um, institutional racism in our own institution. And that means really looking more closely at our policies, uh, our contracts and our practices that we have in place. And, and certainly, as reflected in your demands. Um, I, I think I would just like to say um, with regards to the resolution, um, I, I see there's many ways that we can incorporate your demands. Um, one of the challenges that we have that we need to really look at is, um, and what that was brought up by our public speakers, is that we need to look at um, the increased suspensions and the root of that. And Dr. Wagner had brought that to our attention prior to uh, COVID and the pandemic that there was gonna be work on this. So I believe we really need to continue and really go do a deeper dive and evaluative practice around this. Um, the other thing I just really would like to point out that we might wanna add in, um, in our comments is certainly in the calls to educators across grade levels and content resources that are inclusive of all our diverse le learners to deliver, maybe add culturally relevant curricula to ensure equitable anti-racist instruction throughout the whole year across sub subject areas, not just one week or one month, but really all year long, which is really the what we need to do. It needs to be across grade levels, K-12, but it also needs to be a year long practice in all that we do in every subject area that we do. Um, so I would like to just reiterate what my fellow board members have spoken and that is to take this back and actually have a constructive conversation um, that would incorporate the demands, but also what needs to be done in terms of really um, affecting change in our system. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Ms. Munoz, did you have your hand up? No, sorry, I was about to um, raise my hand, but certainly I, I um, agree with my colleague, you know, with the board about um, including the student voices um, in this and, you know, and also not, not being ready to vote on it. So yeah, I, um, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Simpson. I, I would just like to add to in terms of leaders owning things that we need to do better. And I, it also a part of leadership is also learning how to follow as well. And so I hope that as we're taking this back uh, to look at that we're following what our students and we're hearing and listening what our students say. So in this case, we're following what our students are asking us to do as leaders. Yes, thank you. In that, in that vein, I suggest an um, action plan here. Uh, Obviously, we're going to not move forward on this resolution, but next meeting, I would like us to address each and every demand, uh, including a review of 
the SROs, the student resource officers, it's about time we had the information uh, on the impact. Obviously, we were hearing the negative impact, and that's very alarming. So if we could address at our next meeting each and every one of these demands, and in the interim, uh, meet with student leaders. Uh, we've opened this dialogue with you now. Uh, we're, we're hearing you. We're learning from you. We're following your lead here. So if we can, Mr. Matsuoka, however, is the best way to organize uh, a, a meeting with the student leaders. Uh, I would like that to happen as soon as possible. And for us to take up, like I said, each and every one of these demands as distinct items uh, for our next board meeting. If I have consensus from the board on that, I think that would be good, a good um, action to follow to follow up with. I, I, I concur with that and I'm ready to, let's just go back to the drawing board to make sure that we get it right. I concur as well. Thank you. Anything else? Ms. Caps, can I ask uh, some guidance questions for the team? Yes. Um, so for June 23rd, would you like us to uh, organize a, a conversation at the board level around the student demands or continue a version of the resolution or some hybrid? Uh, I'm just looking for some guidance about how you want us to prepare for that board meeting. Absolutely, thank you for asking. Uh, certainly the resolution is a piece of it because one of the demands is to declare um, publicly um, uh, opposition to the prison pipeline and other I items. So the resolution is a piece, but just one of the pieces. And if we can address each of them um, as soon as possible, not waiting until the 23rd to meet with students, et cetera, but as soon as possible, you know, tomorrow, let's meet, let's determine where we are with our student resource officers and just take this piece by piece. There's six demands, if I'm correct here, um, and we need to move forward on all of them. As has been stated, many are in progress, but we have much more to go. And I think that's the that's what's been conveyed here uh, from all five board members. I can I yeah, Dr. Reed. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to the SROs because I do know there's a history of practice and um, why we have them and why we don't have them. And and historically, I think it's important. Um, to have the history provided about the the background of them, not to say that we shouldn't move forward and eliminate them, but just to so so there's an understanding with the public and with our, our the students why why they exist on our campus. So um, perhaps that could be something that could be brought forward, so that it could enlighten us on our discussion and and, and provide us with. Um, the next steps of what we should do in terms of having them on our campuses. Thank you. Ms. Munoz, did you have a question? Yes, I, I was also gonna say that I would want more information about the SROs um, on the campuses. I hope to be at the next board meeting, but I, I'm having um, a medical um, issue shortly before, so I'm just not sure, you know, if we, um, that I'll be present at it, um, but I'll, I'll make every effort that I can to be there. Thank you. I just wanted to add, it was uh, wonderful to hear from so many students, um, but also the teachers that have weighed in um, and spoke tonight. I just wanted to thank, say thank you to the teachers for being uh, so willing to embrace these changes, these this progress, it's it's important. Okay, with that, I believe we um, need to move forward. We can move forward to the next action item with taking no action on this one uh, at this time. And then we'll be taking a break shortly. But let's just move quickly to action item F2, approval of continuing Santa Barbara Unified School District and West Ed Partnership. Ms. Carey. Yes. yes, good evening, President Caps. 
uh, and board members and cabinet and community. I'm bringing before you a contract with West Ed um, that we've had occasion to discuss before. This is the contract that will enable us to provide what is required for our emergent multilingual students in order to ensure that they have access to grade level English language arts curriculum as well as English uh, des designated English language development. Um, we, you may recall that we have brought to you the courses associated with this curriculum and so this contract will allow us to continue that implementation. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Any questions or comments from so the board? So unless you have uh, questions or comments, I would request your approval of this contract tonight. Um, we have some training needs for our teachers who will be teaching the courses and we want to prepare them for implementation in the fall. Any questions or comments? Dr. Reed? Oh, I, would, I was just going to make a motion. Excellent. Even better. And second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry. I don't, I missed the question because of my volume settings. Can you repeat it? No, you're good. We just voted to approve it. We're all set. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You are, you're welcome. Action item three. F3 is approval of continuing dual language immersion consulting services for Paula Sevilla. Dr. Ramirez. Hi, good evening, uh, board member, Ms. Capps, uh, board, um, board members. Um, this, I bring uh, before you a, um, a contract renewal. It's uh, for Ms. Paula Sevilla, who has uh, worked with us uh, as a consultant this year in getting um, our district organized and primed for expansion of um, dual language immersion into our secondary junior high program and um, developing a, uh, an elementary conversion at McKinley. Um, Ms. Sevilla um, has worked with us this year, has worked in committee, has worked on, um, on a number of different fronts uh, relative to our META plan. Now that that META plan is completed, uh, we also envision her uh, supporting uh, more in a more tactical way also with uh, DLI now that we have um, our hires as well. So um, a lot of work ahead, and we um, have already gotten a great benefit from her support, expertise, and background. So um, with that, I will answer any questions the board may have. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Any questions, comments? <laughs> OK. Seeing none, uh, we need a motion. So moved. Ms. Ford, thank you. I see a second, perhaps, from Ms. Munoz. Second. Uh -huh. uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Next item. That's you, Dr. Wagnick. Approval of proposal for additional counseling services for summer 2020. Sounds like an important thing to be doing this summer of 2020. Uh, take it away. You're muted, Dr. Wagnick. Um, You're muted. Okay. Good evening again. Um, thank you, board. Uh, I bring to you a proposal um, of $50,000 to provide ongoing services to our students grades 7 through 12. This is an extension of our annual contract with Family Service Agency. Um, we felt that in light of the pandemic and now um, the civil um, the civil unrest situation that we have with um, that our students need mental health services more than ever. And so a uh, family service agency has been able to hire two additional FTEs in order to um, cover um, the need. Um, these two FTEs are in addition to their regular staff staying on and I do want to give uh, um, credit where credit is due to FSA that they are also generating funds through Medi-Cal and Holman billing in order to keep many of their therapists on campus, um, uh, well not on campus, uh, working with the students through telehealth and it's important to note that uh, this year unlike 
uh, the last two years, seniors are eligible for this therapy. So the seniors are remaining um, um, in therapy until they can transition into adult services or transition to services at Santa Barbara City College. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, Dr. Reed. I was just, I don't have any questions. I just think it's vitally important. So unless p other people do, I would propose to move this action item forward. Thank you. And I'll just comment with my second that I totally support it. I had the opportunity to be on the, um, the, the meeting that Ms. Ford referenced at the top of this meeting with educators. And one of our counselors spoke um, to the lengths in which she's trying to connect with kids. And this uh, anecdote that she shared was that one of her students um, was struggling and it, she it was revealed that in their one of their sessions that uh, the student couldn't hear on Zoom because of a crowded housing situation and so she dropped off her uh, headphones and it just st stuck with me as how vital uh, especially now these connections are and these counselors and this kind of counseling therapy and sessions are to our students so with that i second the um the action item all in favor aye, aye. aye. motion carries okay and i apologize i uh skipped uh, i called on you too early dr wagnick um f4 so i'm going back to dr ramirez um on item f4 you would think I have the hang of yes. zooming around here with the agenda item on a different screen, but here we go. Doctor, uh, item approval of continuing and consulting services for pro provocative practice for professional learning related to the implementation of a comprehensive plan for multilingual pathways. That is a mouthful, Dr. Uh, Ramirez. Yes, uh, thank you once again, uh, uh, Ms. Caps. Um, uh, so yes, I bring before you a, um, an action item on the renewal of that. Uh, contract as well, a provocative practice. If you recall, uh, uh, Ms. Francisca Sanchez has been our consultant, helped, has helped facilitate uh, the development of and help in conjunction with our ed services and district leadership, uh, the development of the Meta plan. Uh, the next phases include uh, really uh, not just prioritizing uh, components of that plan uh, for, for future implementation and focus, but also helping with uh, shaping some of the models so that they become very concrete uh, and there is 100% clarity on what we mean by uh, linguistically sustaining practices because that's something that is still uh, somewhat elusive and uh, can be misconstrued as somewhat narrow. So there's a lot of work to be undertaken. Uh, we also recognize that um, we as a district leadership and staff will own those efforts, uh, but we just need uh, some ongoing support around prioritization. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, with that, we need a motion. So, so move. Oh, all at once. I saw <laughs> Dr. Reed's hand first. Uh, Dr. Reed, seconded by Ms. Sims Moten. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries, thank you. Okay, I see uh, Mr. Schettler has joined us. So that is item six, approval of amendments to the Santa Barbara County SELPA local plan. Dr. Wagnick and Mr. Schettler. But the, the... Hi, good evening. The special education local plan area or our SELPA has a local plan that governs all the special education work that the districts in the county um, undergo and all the districts in the county are being asked to revise the new template for the SELPA local plan uh, that was contained in the agenda item. No substantive changes, just mainly a new template this year. Okay, sounds performa. Any questions or comments? Nope, okay. Move to approve. Thanks, Ms. Ford, any other? A second? Ms. Sims Moten. Got the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I believe we're at the end of our action agenda. And as tradition, we will take a short break.
um, before we head back to ethnic studies, uh, item G1. So let's see, I, my, my computer says 918. Let's come back, um, let's just come back at, uh, at 9.30. Take a little bio break here um, at this hour and we'll be back at 9.30 to take up ethnic studies. Thanks everybody. Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, it's 9.31 here and uh, appreciate those of you who are participating that have stayed on here. Um, I do wanna explain uh, Ms. Sims Moten has been excused and I know that Ms. Munoz is, is changing location so will be joining us as soon as she can. So with that, we're gonna turn it over to our first item of the report agenda. Oh, I'd like to state that we are going to do a little bit of agenda management given the time and we will be discussing ethnic studies, uh, the two items related to ethnic studies uh, first as stated in the agenda. And then the third item, we will be moving to, to, to the report um, about the reopening of schools in the fall, something I know that many of you are probably um, hanging on here for. So I apologize about the time. Uh, we'll do it. We're doing our best. And I, with that, I turn it over to Ms. Sean Carey. Okay, thank you. And good evening again, President Caps and members of the board. Um, this report is, of course, expressly intended also for our many interested internal stakeholders, as well as the broader audience in our community, many of whom are tuning in tonight. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry, Ms. Sh Ms. Carey. I actually messed up here, and uh, we do have public comment on this agenda item. I went to too quickly, so uh, I will turn it over to Mr. Hio. Apologize for the interruption, and we have uh, several speakers who are speaking to this agenda item, and then we'll get to you. Thank you, President Caps. Yes, we do have um, public comment, and we will start with Mr. Justin Shores. Um, Hi. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Hi. Um, I attended the BLM rally on Saturday in Santa Barbara, and I was really grateful for the message of peace, unity, and condemnation of violence. As someone who doesn't ag agree with the BLM organization's stated goals, such as collective ownership, reparations, defunding the police, and black separatism, I urge the council not to start us down the path by accepting their current demands that they say are just the beginning. In 2017, when police were removed from black communities at BLM request, crime rose dramatically and black lives were lost. We need to cherish and build our black community, not segregate, demonize, and victimize our future generations. It's unacceptable that dissenting opinions, no matter how respectful or well-meaning, are called racist or hate speech. The stats are available to everyone when it comes to how black lives are lost in this country, but police amount for only 0.0004% of those deaths. Almost 20 people have died in the protests over the last few weeks. Who will protest for them? 30 Did seconds. Their lives Do black lives only matter when they're killed by white cops? I know that's harsh, but how will, will removing police president's presence help with school shootings? That's a, that, was, that was a crisis last year, wasn't it? How is removing the police gonna help with that? This feels like a, a media and politicians are just using a terrible tragedy to rally before a major election. I'm sorry, but that's what it looks like. And um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, um, Manya Sai. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I'm Manjot Singh, or Manny Singh, as people know me as. I'm a math teacher at La Colina Junior High. Um, I just wanted to show my unwavering support for our Black youth, um, especially Talia and Shakir. Um, you are an inspiration to your peers and also to many in adults, including myself. Um, I'm in full support of their demands, and I just um, wanted to make clear that these are just um, a springboard for all that our district has to do, um, especially when it comes to the curriculum that we have in our schools um, and just how we are in our classrooms. I think 
we need some support from the board in uh, really taking a closer look at how culturally proficient we are being um, and how culturally, pro culturally proficient our curriculum is. And I also wanted to show support for our ethnic studies curriculum. Thanks. Thank you. So next we have Sheridan Rosenberg. Hi, thank you, board. Um, so I'm actually going to give you a tiny bit of history. Uh, I met with Sean Carey in May of 18, June-ish, and I, did, I wanted to be on the committee as a parent with the child in the district um, for the curriculum committee for ethnic studies. I was one of a number of people who wanted the district to be inclusive and equitable, and certainly this is a, a, a topic I'm very interested in. And so here we are today. Um, I, along with other people, were definitely, um, these meetings were obviously held behind closed doors with no input. And so here we have a semi-finished product. And I did a sort of glance at the reading list and especially at the textbook you wanna use. And I just want to start with, I really want to focus on Howard Zinn's book, The People's History of the United States. I mean, this is a book that has been widely panned and discredited by numerous scholars, especially one I really admire, Mary Graybar. You know, I, for those of you who don't really know who Howard Zinn was, I mean, he was a, a communist. He was a lifelong huge fan of Stalin and Mao. He was a, really a, civic, a sycophantic uh, admirer of these mass murderers and mass enslavers. Well, you know, he kind of created this book that while it was popular, it's really been debunked as sort of a pseudo history. It's full of mistakes and lives and, and half truths and smears. Um, thank the you. The point that I'm really making is that if you had had kind of this broader uh, group of people to provide input, Rosenberg, it's time. This you. at length, and we're shut out from that. And I don't find that, I found that really without any diversity of thought. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have Sarah Henderson. Hi. Go um, ahead. Okay, I just want to second the fact that ethnic studies and a uh, comprehensive and culturally relevant ethnic studies at that was a direct demand by, made by the students to the uh, board as a whole. I also want to remind the board that ethnic studies is not just a course requirement and it is not just one course that somebody has to take. It's a whole uh, holistic way of transforming the school district or the school district's like thinking and its um, organization as a whole. Specifically, I want to uh, talk about equitable hiring practices and making sure that we are hiring or teachers who both reflect and mirror the students they are teaching and who are versed and experienced in teaching ethnic studies. This was yeah, this was a, um, a demand from the very beginning of the ethnic studies and uh, third world liberation front movements beginning in um, San Francisco State University. And I would hope that we can continue that fight here today. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Chrisita Silvers. Um, Hello? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, I attended Sunday's rally, uh, and I was thrilled by the leadership our young people showed in organizing and conducting the day's powerful events. I'm even more thrilled by their demands. These are long overdue. They are not knee-jerk reactions to a singular event. These are years and years in the making. The only difference is that now people are listening people who previously have had the privilege to be unaware are finally listening. This is a moment, people, to finally address the lack of representation in our classrooms, the school to prison pipeline, and to implement meaningful programs to improve the physical and social emotional health of your students. 
You, as the adult leaders, need to decide if you're going to be on the right side of this moment. Please support all the demands presented on Sunday in full. Do not be swayed by the Amy Coopers from unfair education. I am a white mom with three school-aged children here, and I want my children to know that accomplished people in positions of authority come in all colors, including black. I want my children to have an education that does not define everything white as worthy of studying and segregate anything else into a special day or week or even month. If you miss this opportunity that has been graciously handed to you by Talia and Shakir and the other youth leaders, you do a disservice to them and to all the students being denied a fuller, safer, healthier education. I know you can do this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Capps, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you, thank you to our speakers. And again, uh, now back to you, Ms. Carey, sorry about that. No problem. It's exhibits the public engagement that I was talking about when we pivoted to the public comment that was waiting on the topic. Um, so as has been referred to throughout the course of the evening, um, there's a long history around ethnic studies, but particularly in the last five years, there's been renewed and increased interest in widely establishing ethnic studies in schools, not just locally, but statewide. Um, and we've been discussing throughout the evening the impact of the actions um, led by our youth um, and our own high school students relevant to this topic, uh, so we, we know all about that. Um, and we know that some of their demands were specific to the implementation of ethnic studies. The grad requirement was first established in November 2018, and we've attached prior board reports to serve as a reference and painting a picture of our journey to this point. But today we're gonna focus on delivering a slide presentation that will provide a comprehensive, high-level update of the status of our ethnic studies implementation and we'll be presenting to you tonight as a consortium comprised of Santa Barbara Unified staff, expert consultants based in LA and throughout the state, as well as representatives of the community. Presenters are going to briefly introduce themselves to you before speaking to the information that they'll present on the slides. And while it takes a collaborative effort to achieve what we'll be launching this fall, and with much appreciation extended to those who paved the way for this grad requirement, Two decades ago here in Santa Barbara, educators such as Tony Jackson, Elena Oliveira, Pete Rellis, the fact that every SB Unified student will experience ethnic studies by the time graduation comes is a direct result of the grassroots movement and advocacy embodied by Ethnic Studies Now Santa Barbara. So with that, I'll turn it over to the co-founder of Ethnic Studies Now Santa Barbara, Fabiola Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Carey, and hello, everybody. My name is Fabiola Gonzalez Gutierrez, and I was born and raised here in Santa Barbara. I attended Santa Barbara Unified Schools, and I'm a founding member of Ethnic Studies Now Santa Barbara, like uh, Assistant Superintendent Sean Carey just mentioned. Um, as we present this report to you today, I wanted us to be grounded and to really start by grounding ourselves in the history of ethnic studies. Ethnic Studies was born from the Third World Liberation Front in 1969 at San Francisco State University. Ethnic Studies is the only academic discipline that rose and developed as a result of student and community struggle. That is the struggle and demand for communities of color to see themselves in their education. It is a discipline that comes from the grassroots and it comes from the people. Do you mind going to the next slide? Ethnic studies is a field of study in which students learn about the political, social, economic, cultural, and intersectional experience of American Indians, Native Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans, and Chicana, Chicanos, Latinas, Latinos within and beyond the United States. Research shows us that ethnic studies benefits all students. Across the state, there have been movements for ethnic studies. We are seeing that more and more school districts are incorporating ethnic studies courses. They are expanding their ethnic studies offerings 
and they are pushing for ethnic studies requirements for graduation. Next slide, please. The ethnic studies implementation process has been ongoing and it began five years ago with ethnic studies now Santa Barbara when local youth, community members, educators, elders, and leaders came together to organize for a quality and sustainable ethnic studies graduation requirement. The class of 2024 will be the first to be required to see and to take the ethnic studies courses. And as you can see on this implementation timeline, there's a, a lot of bullets on, on there highlighting different pieces that we hope to accomplish as we progress in this. And as you can see, we have some work to do. Some of that work is gonna continue this summer with some professional learning. And in, in the fall, we hope to launch two courses. As the youth stated in their demands, I hope that we will be able to hire teachers of color that have a background in ethnic studies to teach ethnic studies courses. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you. I'm so pleased to be here with you all. My name is Anna Guerrero. I'm an English and social science teacher at Dos Pueblos High School and a member of the ES Cadre. And we can all hear me? Yes, Bobby, I'm looking at you. Can you hear me? Oh, wonderful. Uh, Rick, do you mind moving to the next slide for me? Sorry, Todd Rickman. To call you Rick. Okay. Uh, as we prepare to launch the ethnic and social justice studies graduation requirement, it is important to take note of our students' course requests for the fall. Dos Pueblos, San Marcos, and Santa Barbara High School will have a combined total of 725 incoming freshmen completing the new requirement through a co seeded English 9 with an ethnic and social justice studies emphasis. Additionally, at the three traditional high schools, just shy of 400 students in grades 9 through 12, have signed up for the Ethnic and Social Justice Studies elective course. Altogether, next year, over 1,100 students in the Santa Barbara Unified High Schools be exposed to curriculum rooted in the tenets and discipline of ethnic studies. And that number includes a full two-thirds of our incoming freshmen. As to the teachers of this vital coursework, there currently exists an ethnic studies cadre of 11 instructors, representing four of our five high schools and two instructional support specialists who are working closely and increasingly more frequently. I'm sorry, could we move to the next slide? I, we're, oh, we're, never mind, we're almost there. That's okay, we'll leave it there, sorry. Um, who are working closely and increasingly more frequently with our community partners, our expert consultants, and our administration to ensure these classes are both culturally relevant and community responsive. Next slide, please. In order for students to meet the ethnic studies graduation requirement, we have a variety of course options. We have the two new courses, English 9 with an ethnic and social justice studies emphasis and the elective course, ethnic and social justice studies. We have our existing course offerings, Mexican American literature and Chicano studies. Additionally, students will have a large variety of options through our dual enrollment, enrollment partnership with Santa Barbara City College. Moving forward, we will be continuing to build upon our ethnic studies qualifying courses to offer an even greater variety of options for students to meet the five unit requirement and in order to allow students to continue to follow their interests in this important discipline. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Powers and I'm a teacher at San Marcos High School. Uh, I piloted the English 9 Ethnic Studies courses in this last school year, um, and I'm here to talk about the purpose of the common framework, um, and the purpose is to ground our classes, current and future, in a common vision that speaks both to the discipline of ethnic studies and also uses the California model curriculum for ethnic studies as its basis. The framework that you see on your screen includes more than I will speak to today, but in summary, ethnic studies is the interdisciplinary study that centers Asian Americans, Chicanx, Latinx, American Indians and Native Americans, and Africana, Black, African Americans who have experienced, survived, and resisted hegemonic systems. Um, hegemonic systems means dominant systems of whiteness and structures of oppression. 
topics in our courses will use different intersectional lenses, which include, but are not limited to gender or class, um, to analyze indigeneity, which means the recognition of our indigenous land and the ancestral roots of the students in our classrooms. Aspects of decolonization, white supremacy, oppression and privilege. Teachers will work to empower students and foster active social engagement, radical healing, and critical hope. And you can move to the next slide. So in combination um, with our work in the pilot courses this last year, guidance from our expert consultants and feedback from our community stakeholders, we have built two strong courses for implementation next year. The first course is our English 9 course with an ethnic and social justice studies emphasis. This course will also be co-seeded as we move to create more equitable spaces for our students. The units of study are each tied to a core text, so we use the literature, we use the English content to teach ethnic studies theory. And our second course is a single semester social studies elective course, which is open to ninth um, through 12th graders, and it's titled Ethnic and Social Justice Studies. The units of study will pull from many different historical documents, texts, and reading in order to create a comprehensive study and reframing of United States history and society using those intersectional lenses um, we mentioned in the framework. So we ask the board that you please approve these two new courses um, on June 23rd. Thank you, you can move to the next slide. Thank you, um, good, e good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos Estrada. I'm a teacher in the Quetzal program, which is part of Alta Vista Alternative Junior High and High School. Talking about intersectionality, right? One of the tenets of uh, ethnic studies. I am also a father to three daughters in the secondary schools here in Santa Barbara Unified School District. And uh, being a teacher at um, Quetzal, in the Quetzal program, I'm directly centered in the prison and school nexus um, in our school district but I'm also part of the ethnic studies cadre that developed ethnic studies courses. Um, ethnic studies uh, pedagogy. When we talk about ethnic studies pedagogy, we are talking about the approach to educating and teaching. To say that teachers are trained in ethnic studies pedagogy is to say that teachers are grounded in the theory and practice that results in relating well to students, demonstrating authentic, caring, and deep respect for students as intellectual and full human beings, which leads to have an asset-based approach to the student's academic <laughs> abilities. A critical aspect of e uh, ethnic studies pedagogy focuses on creating culturally relevant and community responsive curriculum. This is done by equipping students with tools to better understand the social inequities and the structural forces that share their lives while also making a space for dialogue about tangible strategies to socially transform the communities. By being aligned to uh, state standards and having an academically rigorous approach, we make a space for students to reflect and act on their own learning and school experience and invite conversations about study in each discipline. Lastly, it is important to highlight that uh, an ethics studies pedagogy deliberately looks to develop critical thinking and critical consciousness uh, by centering the youth, moving away from the banking concept of education that uh, Paulo Freire put forth uh, as, as a, a, a critique of, um, as the primary thinkers and innovators of solutions in their communities, especially around issues of race and racism. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so ethnic studies, pedagogy and professional learning. Here, one second. What I'd like to say is in order to ground teachers in ethnic studies pedagogy and facilitate ongoing uh, professional learning, we have looked to a variety of resources and arrangements of learning, kind of from top to bottom as you see them there. All these sources and arrangements prioritize dialogue, that's very important, uh, in order to facilitate a deep collective understanding amongst teachers. Our initial dialogue being the first uh, two things there at, at the top of, of the list there, Ethnic Studies Curriculum Development Committee and Rethinking Ethnic Studies. Um, 
our initial dialogue uh, centered around looking at the historical and pedagogic foundations of ethics studies. So that's what the two did there. We did the, uh, this through our study of rethinking uh, ethnic studies resource book, which is closely aligned to the state, uh, to the work being done at the state level and our participation in ethnic studies curriculum development committee. As we refined our understanding of historical and pedagogic uh, foundations of ethnic studies, we arranged our professional development in a more specific and nuanced way. Uh, this led uh, us to create the ES cadre in consulting uh, our professional learning uh, and grounding in ethnic studies pedagogy by continuing to work with ethnic studies now, out of practice, and studying professional literature and uh, attending conferences. And that's where we're at with it right now. So uh, my name is Teresa Montano. I am a professor at Cal State Northridge and a member of ARE, um, the team that's been working with this um, wonderful group of Ethnic Studies Now and the Ethnic Studies Cadre, all committed to Ethnic Studies. I think what's been clear for me uh, tonight has been the critical role that community plays, not only in the development and the foundational work that came to develop ethnic studies, but the importance of continuing community engagement through the ethnic studies classrooms. So the praxis of community engagement, which I won't read for you here, you can read that for yourself, is gonna be critical not only to the work of uh, the classroom teachers and the students, but a part of that is going to mean that we engage multiple community partners in an ongoing dialogue about how to implement ethnic studies in this district. Having said that, one of the things that the team will be doing in the future is holding a community forum to provide opportunities for a more detailed review of the curriculum. Community efforts were instrumental in establishing ethnic studies as a graduation requirement. They will be instrumental in continuing the work. Ethnic studies is about not only seeing the marginalized communities, the racialized communities of color in the curriculum, but as it's been said, it's not only for students of color and native students. An ethnic studies curriculum truly benefits all students. Teresa, and so my name is uh, Guadalupe Cardona, and I am the Are Praxis Chair. And so, um, as Teresa mentioned before, we are working with the, the cadre and with the community to uh, plan a community forum. A date will be coming soon, and we hope to uh, engage the community, all of you out there, in the conversation with these um, amazing uh, partners in creating ethnic studies here in Santa Barbara. Thank you. Thank you to all the presenters and certainly board were available for your comments or questions. Thank you to all of the presenters, not just for this evening, but for the years and years of work. Uh, I am so appreciative that you're saying there might, there will be a town hall and a community forum because we, the more, the better. We certainly heard that loud and clear tonight and we know that in our hearts. But thank you. And so I would like to turn it over to the board with any questions or comments on this presentation. Uh, Dr. Reed. Hi, um, I want to just uh, put a special shout out to Sean Carey and her leadership in, in this process. Um, because I think her leadership to bring and coalesce and bring together everybody in the community, educators, uh, researchers, um, all of the people here tonight, of course, um, to really bring their voices forward and, and to, um, to link this together um, so closely with the community. And I wanna thank Fabi for being the leader with Ethnic Studies Now, because Ethnic Studies Now is, is much like um, the movement we are right now with black, um, with uh, with with the black students and supporting our black students, and it's so vital. It's it's too bad that we have to have a movement make a change. But once again, um, it's the people and the community 
that have um, brought forward this change. And I just feel that um, it's exciting that we are finally at this point. My passion since I've been, um, actually my life's work in education is around culturally relevant pedagogy. And my, my passion on the school board has been to push for more equitable practices around this work. And so to see this process take place, though it's taken a number of years, um, multiple years to finally achieve this work. Um, the community engagement piece, as I said, um, is vital to ensure our students identities are mirrored in the curriculum and that those hidden histories um, come forward and are revealed and integrated in, in our language arts and our social sciences programs and across the curricula. Um, and my dream and hope is that it doesn't remain in just high school grad requirement um, coursework, but really that it needs to start in um, an early education in elementary, starting um, with our kindergarten all the way through. It needs to be infused and integrated. So um, I, I, I can't say enough about um, the excitement of this moment in time of this launch. Um, I'm thrilled with the practice of community engagement that's being brought forward, um, the town hall meetings that will continue, the involvement of the students, their voices again, which are crucial um, to bringing this forward and, and bringing um, the conversation into the classroom that is um, relevant for them currently and where they see we need to go in, in this uh, 21st century world. So I, um, I'm thrilled. I'll, I'll end it with that and not go on and on. I totally, um, look forward to this this launch and i want to thank everybody on this um presentation tonight again and everybody in the community that has supported this effort thank you dr reed miss munoz yes um i very much echo you know the um what dr reed is is uh, stating and thank you so much for all the um effort and dedication, you know, the excellence in the present, this presentation and the years of working on this. I mean, I, I've certainly had um, attended originally, you know, ethic studies now. I've gone to your groups, you know, your um, gatherings and been um, witness to all the work that's behind this um, and the collaboration between, you know, um, between Sean Carey, between Fabi, you know, Fabi's mom being outside the school board, <laughs> getting us um, there organized and, and in her honor. And of course, of all the different, you know, all the participants and all of you professionals that are here uh, to support us as, as we see this through. So no, I'm, I'm very excited and, and looking forward to this implementation. And also, as Dr. Reed said, I see it for, you know, for all of our students in the school district um, and hopefully, you know, soon for the students from elementary on up. So thank you. <laughs> Bien hecho. Ms. Ford. Oh, thanks so much. I, I only can echo the feelings of my fellow board members um, and we have been in strong support of this, I think, from the start. So it's great to see it evolve. I do have a question about the next steps, and um, I'm sorry if I missed it in the reading, but if we are going to have the pilots, then Ms. Carey, what are the next steps in identifying the teachers and getting them, uh, getting students signed up and getting them the materials they need? Uh, so we have run the pilots already. That was this school year. And next school year, we, we, we elicited course requests from students in February. We have over 1,100 students who will be taking these two courses next year. Um, so the cadre teachers' names are listed there in the slide deck. Um, that's been the group that's been meeting and all those teachers' names are listed there because they are assigned ethnic studies qualifying courses in next year's master schedules. Perfect, I misread that, thanks. Yeah, no, I'm happy to clarify. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate it. Uh, we are moving to the second part of this conversation, which is actually to talk about the courses. 
So uh, Ms. Carey, if you'd like to move on to that, please. Thank you. And thanks to all of our speakers. Yes, quite, quite briefly, unless the board desires otherwise, this is a separate but quite related item. Um, you heard about the courses already and you heard about them in a contextualized way within the report. But this is the item that, that just very explicitly requests um, your approval at our subsequent board meeting um, of the, the two courses that were piloted this year and that we are putting forward um, to run next year in order to give opportunities, broad opportunities to students to fulfill the newly established graduation requirement. Um, so we're happy to answer other questions about the, the courses specifically and with your permission would bring it back, would bring it back on the agenda on the 23rd. Oops, I'm sorry. Any questions about the courses? I, yeah, Dr. Reed. Only to say that I wish I could have taken them <laughs> back in the day. So uh, I'm excited. I, I, um, I would love to be able to sit in and, um, and, and, and participate in some way. Well, they probably don't want me participating, but I would love to, to, to you know, just be a fly on the wall in one of those classrooms. It sounds so exciting and um, I'm looking forward to um, actually talking to students as they go through the course to get their feedback on their thoughts and um, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. I had the same reaction. Would have, would have liked for my uh, ninth, my learning at Santa Barbara High to include, include these texts. So thanks for providing that and for coming to us with the chance to digest it, learn about it, and then back for a vote next meeting. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Okay. Thanks to the ethnic studies community and the team uh, for this for this update, showing progress of years in the making. And I'm so glad as this board, uh, you know, passed this requirement in 2018 that we're making this kind of progress and that we're talking about this tonight. Okay, uh, with that, we're gonna move, like I mentioned, on to the agenda item uh, discussing reopening of schools. And we'll get to the other items uh, sometime, um, hopefully before it's tomorrow. Uh, so I took it, turned it over to Dr. Wagonick to talk about her report um, on COVID and the, the thought process to leading up to reopening of schools in August. Um, I'm sorry, President Caps. We have um, public comment on item G5. I did it again. We need to go to the public, of course. So we have a few uh, speakers who have hung in here and would like to speak about this very important topic. So thank you, Mr. Hill. Yes. Um, we will start with Ms. Allison Bell. Go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, you can start. Uh, my name is Allison Bell. I'm a former high school biology teacher in Santa Cruz, California. I was a sp science specialist at Adams Elementary and have had children at Adams Elementary for 11 years with four more years to go. I'm also the outgoing PTA president. On behalf of a long list of parents of Santa Barbara Elementary School students, I unequivocally endorse a fully reopened elementary school system in August. I understand the difficulty of you overseeing a unified school district, but cannot stress more strongly that at this point, the at-home learning is not working for K-6 students, and in particular, that sector of our population where both parents must work to sustain the household and have been economically dislocated. We know elementary school teachers have been working hard to provide the best experiences feasible under these conditions when much was not known about COVID-19 virus. We are grateful for their efforts, but continuation of at-home learning or hybrid minimum days will not meet the needs of our children, both academically and for their social emotional well-being. Working parents cannot tend to both provide and oversee our children's education and sustain our households at the same time. Many living spaces are not large enough for our children to conduct learning in a distraction-free environment, which also require continual mentoring tutoring and overseeing transitions between lessons. Our children in this age spectrum require full in-home attention to complete their schoolwork successfully, which just is not currently possible on an ongoing sustainable basis. Um, it's, it's time, okay. Thank you for your, for your hearing me. Thank you. 
Next we have Sarah Gorman. Sarah, can you hear us? Okay, Sarah, are you there? Yes, are you, oh. are you calling me Sarah Gorman? I just finished the city council meeting. You, you can start, thank you. Wonderful, thank, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to um, thank all of you, uh, the board members, Superintendent Maldonado, Superintendent Wagenek, and I just wanted to encourage you in the strongest possible language that the district engage in full in-person learning in the fall for elementary students. I'm a single parent of a rising fourth grader at Adams Elementary, and we love Adams, but elementary kids are not learning with remote learning. If the board directs the district to engage in elementary level remote learning for fall, please know that's a vote against students, against their learning, and against their mental health. I know this era is challenging for teachers, as have been the past several months, but the teachers rose to the occasion so far, and I know they're going to rise to these new challenges. I recognize the teachers have health concerns and child care challenges. That's true, if not more of parents. As an essential worker, I just finished working. Um, I cannot tutor my nine-year-old child and simultaneously work. And tutoring, sitting with the kid for almost every moment of the school day is what it takes for remote learning. So please place the children back in school. If it's physically impossible to place the children in school full time, then please engage in hybrid learning. And if that means that my daughter learns for half the time, that's better than none. But in-person learning is the only way the kids are gonna learn. Please get them back in the classroom. I wanna thank you and all the tremendous staff for all your work in this time of such upheaval, anguish, and learning in our country and our community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next we have Amanda Rios. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello everyone, thank you so much for your time. Um, I appreciate you guys listening to us tonight. Um, I would like to echo what Allison and, and Sarah just spoke to all about. I am a mother of two children who attend elementary school. I am also the mother of a special needs child who is experiencing lots of regression as we're going through this distance learning. And I want to implore you to open a fully reopened elementary school as we go back into August. We know, we've all, you've heard from us about the difficulties we understand of overseeing this transition, but we know how important it is to be able to open the school so that our children can begin learning as it has not been happening. Working parents cannot tend to both provide and oversee our children's education and sustain households. And I just want to add on to what Allison said. We're though the parents who are able to work and sustain a household are the lucky ones. There are many parents that are unable to provide housing and provide food um, because of it, it, scarcity that is happening amongst a vast a, a, a lot of our community, and it's providing a disservice to them to remain for schools to remain closed. So I would I'm imploring you to open the schools now um, and, and in August in order to move forward. And I'm I'm excited to see what you guys will put forward to help our, our teachers and our students continue learning in the fall. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our last speaker is Marcus uh, Swain. Hi all, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. All right, I'm, I'm pretty much echoing what Allison and uh, Amanda said. In my opinion, I believe our children, especially the elementary kids, should go back to school as fall, business as usual. I know there's risks involved, but with the proper measures, safety and control, we can manage those risks. I've heard of some communities weighing the options of using the entire school district for elementary only. I believe it's imperative that elementary schools go back to school. Older kids in junior high and high school are better equipped for distance learning. I don't know if this is an option that has been considered, but I'd like to put it on the table. Distance learning, especially for those with children with special needs, it's just not working, and especially for those with parents who have to work that are essential employees. Thank you, and thank you all for your time. Thank you. President Caps, that concludes public comment for this item and for thank the night. Thank you so much to our speakers.
Uh, now I turn it back to you, Dr. Wagner. All right, I'd like to, uh, Mr. Rickman, if you could, um, the slide deck up, please. And while he's doing that, um, thank you, President Capps, um, board, Mr. Matsuoka. I, I was, uh, while the, the speakers, um, the public speakers were expressing their concerns, I was ref, uh, listening and reflecting on the fact that I don't think that I have been a participant in a board meeting that um, simultaneously had such um, important issues um, that we're facing. And it's a gestalt of what we're going through as a country. Um, it's a time of great amb uh, ambiguity and uncertainty. And I want to, before diving into, um, diving into this report, to let those who are, are listening as well as the board know that it is our full commitment um, to get students back to school uh, full time as quickly as possible. Um, but we, I do have to acknowledge the anxiety, uh, the depression um, that um, people worldwide are experiencing because of this. And um, I, I think it would be um, unwise to, to proceed without stating that first. So, um, Mr. Rickman, next slide, please. Um, so my goal tonight is um, there is still going to be ambiguity. There is still going to be uncertainty and vagueness. Um, that's because we are looking at August 18th from an obscured uh, vantage point. We do not know what the future will bring. In fact, California, um, as of today, is one of 26 states that saw an increase in the number of COVID cases post Memorial Day. Um, I don't say this to um, bring doom and gloom. Rather, it's my job to um, bring to the board uh, facts and the truth and and so that's what the board can expect from me throughout this process over the next few months um so he, we have a number of us assumptions and considerations that we have already um we we are operating from and i think it's important for um for the community for our staff and for the board to understand what these assumptions are the first is that COVID-19 is going to remain in circulation until a vaccine is developed and widely used. It will be out there. Um, the most important thing that we can do is to um, practice safe health and hygiene. Now, broad stay-at-home orders and long-term school closures, they are unlikely. And I'll get to our scenarios in a mo moment, but they are possible and it is possible and we are planning for the fact that we could reopen um, in one scenario in August and be in a different scenario in November or January. Um, teaching and we're going to have to teach and reinforce uh, prevention behaviors in order to stave off uh, the virus in our community and in our schools and frequent cleaning and disinfecting will uh, be required what do we know? We know that it'll be safe uh, for schools to return to quote normal, whatever the new normal is, operations when all of the following have, have occurred. The stay at home order has been completely lifted. The number of confirmed COVID cases in our, our county has remained constant. And um, that a directive regarding social distancing and group gatherings has been established that allows us to bring larger groups of um, students and adults into campuses. Now, I will state that we're starting to get um, more and more guidance, and, and tomorrow the County Public Health Department is going to release a statement about what will be required for our local schools to get, um, I guess we call the clean bill of health, to be able to 
um, go back to school. So that will be coming out and I encourage folks to um, look at that when it comes out tomorrow. Next slide, please. Um, now when schools are permitted to reopen, um, this is what folks can expect. One, we will have to do a daily proactive screening of students and staff for symptoms. We will have to set up teams uh, who are using uh, no-touch thermometers, are um, looking at students and staff for symptoms, et cetera. We will have to incorporate social distancing in all our settings, including home to school transportation, uh, such as our elementary school buses. And um, as much as possible, and it's looking good on this front preliminarily, is that our school days will align with our partner districts, our, our partner elementary districts as much as possible. Now, it is not our expe expectation at this time, looking from this obscured vantage point that conditions are going to improve quickly enough to allow schools to achieve what we had in, in terms of pre-pandemic operations. Um, that, what does that mean? It means that there uh, will be limits on group or class sizes and gatherings. Um, and that's likely where we're going to be in August, even if we continue to loosen restrictions um, because we will need to have physical distancing and uh, will not be able to have large gatherings. However, if at any point that changes, um, we will adjust. Uh, next slide, please. Um, acknowledging what folks have, have shared and what I talked about at the beginning, we know um, that children and youth are feeling isolated um, they're fearful, they miss their friends, um, and that's gonna result in the need for increased mental health supports. And we are already working with our partners, Family Service Agency and CALM to plan for um, that increased um, level of mental health supports. And when I talk about that, I am obviously talking about our students, but also our staff. Um, uh, studies of um, pandemic, uh, past pandemics show that um, the vast majority of people do exit a pandemic with post-traumatic stress, not necessarily a disorder, but a syndrome um, or, or uh, trauma that's impacting them. So um, we have already seen an increased number of suicide attempts um, and suicidal ideation amongst youth in our community. Um, so we need to address that. We also know that the pandemic, um, after the pandemic is likely uh, substance abuse. Um, the district attorney's office, uh, DA Dudley's office has stated that um, the reports of child abuse um, of serious child abuse and domestic abuse has increased during this time. And so um, that will further lead to more trauma. Um, the economic impact of the pandemic is going to be significant. And we heard um, the parents um, prior to this presentation talk about the impact that that has on families. And we know that and we are aware um, that will not only impact um, families, but we're looking at decreased state revenues, um, local layoffs, um, and also the increased number of students requiring free and reduced lunch and those experiencing homelessness. Uh, we are working right now to already add to um, the number of students on free and reduced lunch by um, signing individual or families up for that. Next slide, please. An assumption or consideration that we have to think about is the fact that attendance rates may decline into the school year. If we have inf infection or exposure, um, children will have to quarantine 
um, adults may have to quarantine. These are considerations we have to think of. Um, fears and rumors get out there about infection or exposure. Um, the demand for temporary and substitute employees is something we have to plan for ahead of time. And then um, this is a big, the next one is a big one. And I want um, both the staff and the parents um, who are, are watching to know that we are already grappling with the childcare issue. Um, the childcare issue by our employees is especially concerning if their schedule does not align with that of their children. Um, that's something that we have to uh, work with our community to solve that issue in the next two months. Uh, we know that student learning outcomes going into the year are going to be uneven. Um, the, the closure impacted students differently. Um, and um, so teachers already have gone into the summer knowing that there will be learning to be made up even um, when we may possibly be in a situation of only being in school um, several days a week. Um, and then finally, uh, as we are well aware, there exists a broad spectrum of opinions in the community regarding um, government and school district responses to COVID. People have different opinions, they have different needs, and as a district, we have to hold that and um, move forward and, and plan. Next slide, please. So what are our readiness scenarios? We, are, we have three scenarios that we're working from. And, and the scenarios will be determined by the prevalence of COVID-19 in Santa Barbara County later on this summer. At, at a certain point, we will have to call it. Um, so here are the three options. 100% um, remote. Um, at a later board meeting, we will get into more details about what instruction will look like if we have to stay in 100% remote. Um, instruction scenario, but I will say at this point that we know um, we made a decision on the 13th of March to close school and on the 16th it was closed and um, in two weeks we turned around and had 800 teachers teaching remotely and 14,000 students um, learning remotely. Um, there it, there is um, professional learning in the works um, to prepare us for um, a remote learning situation. Um, the next is full face-to-face. -face. COVID um, all but disappears or it is uh, not a threat to um, Santa Barbara County and we are able to open um, to the new normal um, in a pre-pandemic fashion. And then finally, hybrid learning. Um, this is the um, scenario that is most likely. It is the scenario we are planning for because um, not only is it the most likely, but it is much easier to pivot for us to the 100% remote or the full face-to-face. -face. So. Um, it sets us up to um, respond if the scenario changes. Next slide. So um, how do we do this? That is the big question. How do we, um, one, decide what the hybrid models are and uh, what informs our decision making. These are the drivers that um, were developed to really what the drivers do is organize our work. We have two months to get um, a gargantuan feat done and we will do it, but we have to get organized. And so what we've really done is compartmentalize our work into these five, um, these five drivers. In, so this is our schema for our work. Um, Instruction is at the center as it should be. Um, we also have health and wellness. Uh, as I said before, we know that social emotional learning 
and mental wellness is important, but also a focus on health and hygiene um, in order to stave off the virus. Um, community and family engagement, it is um, always important that we work in tandem with our families, but now more than ever, um, we need to be doing that work and engaging as we move forward. Um, facilities and operations is really the, the, the district operations for transportation, how we clean our safety protocols. Um, and then finally, governance and leadership that's coordinating all of the services and our policies um, all through a lens of equity and access, making sure that all students in our district are um, served and have the same opportunities. Next slide, please. So what's our timeline bid? Um, once we had about six weeks under our belt of remote learning and had um, worked out the grading policy, um, it was time to start working on opening school plans. So that really started at the end of April. Um, we spent the month of May, um, um, evaluating, generating and evaluating schedule models for a hybrid scenario. Um, we are now in the process of um, selecting models for a hybrid scenario, a model for elementary school and a model for secondary. Um, we do have um, a design team and then subgroups for elementary and um, secondary that are working on those scenarios. Um, the design teams are made up of a, a combination of district leadership and SBTA representation, including um, uh, teachers on both of those subgroups. Uh, we will be bringing, uh, we are doing this report now, we'll be bringing a second report to the school board, um, asking the school board to bringing, sorry, bringing the school board our final recommendations for hybrid scenarios on June 23rd. Um, and uh, with the expectation that we will get um, the approval of the board to move forward. Um, next would become the implementing the plans. So the, from June 24th to August uh, 17th, we'll be doing our planning and implementation. And then when school starts August 18th, we will have ongoing implementation evaluation and adjusting as needed. Uh, next slide. So we, um, I did state that we have teacher representatives on our um, design teams. Um, in addition, we did a survey of our teachers. Um, we had over 400 teachers respond to that survey, which is uh, more than a 50% response rate. Um, so it's statistically valid. Uh, the survey was co-constructed um, by district leadership and SBTA. Um, there were models, uh, two elementary survey models and um, three secondary models. Um, we gathered quantitative da data. The, the teachers indicated which choice uh, they most preferred. Um, teachers were also able to give qualitative data, provide that through comments on the survey. And then um, we also had set up a question and answer document, um, which uh, when I created that document, the intention was to answer questions about the models themselves. Uh, thankfully, in retrospect, it actually turned into a clearinghouse of questions about everything related to the reopening of school. And um, I'm actually, I do want to put a, put a point on this that um, we are so thankful for the comments that came through that question and answer document from our teachers. They were able to, we could feel um feel their emotions um their frustrations their anxieties um their um thoughtful um input 
Um, and we actually did not turn off the Q&A document when we stopped the survey and we continue to have teachers um, putting questions or thoughts on there and we're up to nearly 200 um, questions or thoughts. So that became a sort of treasure trove of qualitative data that we were able to um, use. So next slide, please. So the results for elementary, um, there were two models. Um, I'm not gonna dive deeply into the models today because um, we'll be bringing that back on Ju June 23rd, uh, a final model to recommend. There were two models. One was an AM PM model where um, half the students would attend school in the morning and half in the afternoon. Um, what teachers told us was that students uh, would be able to see their teachers every day, that it's simpler and it provides more consistency. Um, preschool already uses this model and it's effective for them. 55% um, of the respond responding elementary teachers did choose this model. Um, there's a point here that says the principals support this model. They actually corrected me yesterday and said, um, they are still, our elementary uh, principals are still grappling with um, which they prefer. So um, we can disregard that point. Um, the other model was a two and a half day a week model uh, where half the school go to uh, attend school on Monday and Wednesday, the other half on um, Tuesday, Thursday, and then um, half in the morning on Friday, half in the afternoon. Um, the points that came out for in, in favor of this uh, were that it's easier to disinfect classrooms between cohorts of students when students are there all day because um, staff can clean for several hours instead of having an hour to clean in between groups of students. Um, it's easier to plan instruction. Um, there are fewer students on campus each day, only half uh, the population of the school is there each day, thus uh, limiting exposure. Another point was that core subjects are better accessed in the morning than the afternoon. And so in the AM or PM model, um, perhaps those students who attend in the afternoon would be at a disadvantage in terms of their core studies. And then finally, the response rate was uh, that 45% of the elementary teachers who responded chose this model. Next slide, please. Secondary, in the secondary we had three um, models. And as I looked at the data, I saw um, what was popping out. And that was that there was a large discrepancy between the junior high schools and the high school respondents. Um, the first model, which um, what we call more of a traditional model, um, periods one through six, except at San Marcos, which is periods one through four, um, with students attending school uh, one day a week, Zooming with their um, class another day a week, and having support at school on Friday. Um, junior high schools, uh, teachers over, that was their number one choice at 55%. But for um, high school, uh, high school teachers, uh, it was less popular. Our second model, um, which we really um, have pulled off the table at this point, uh, was unpopular with both junior high and high school receiving less than 15% of the vote with both groups. And then finally, um, we have the model, uh, a nine week block model where students would take periods one, two, and three for nine weeks and then periods four, five, and six for another nine weeks. Uh, San Marcos would use its same model. However, um, students would attend school um, physically uh, one day a week um, as this was um, put forward. Junior high schools, um, I think because, maybe because they're less, um, familiar with a block schedule, um, we're not as in favor of this. 
but but thirty five percent were, and then the high schools almost fifty percent were in favor of this model. And then um, we also had a question: If a virtual independent study model was offered, would you be interested in teaching students in a remote setting? We wanted to know that if uh, a group of students was interested in remaining on a remote um, learning situation, do we have the teachers um, interested in teaching? And 22% said yes. 43% said, I'm curious and I'd like to learn more. So we have 65% um, who um, are saying yes or are curious, which uh, was an interesting finding to have. And then 35% said no. Moving on. So um, a second slide. So that was actually, um, that was an aggregate score that I just showed you. There was a mistake on the slide, I apologize. This is how it broke out for elementary and secondary. So both in elementary and secondary, we have teachers who are interested in teaching remotely, um, even if we go to a hybrid or we open up entirely. Moving on. We also had qualitative results, survey comments. Um, health and safety for our teachers was a significant concern. Um, in fact, the vast, vast majority are very concerned about their own health and safety in terms of returning to work. Um, the logistics uh, around disinfecting um, is huge. And I think it's incumbent on us to start answering those questions for how that will work in order to uh, assuage their, their concerns. And then um, teachers who are at greatest risk and, and folks were honest with us that they have underlying conditions or because of their age or the age of their spouses, they're really questioning their options right now um, about the safety of going back to work. The second big point that popped out was that dependent care responsibility that I talked about earlier. Children, but also elderly parents and spouses um, that folks are caring for is, is a real sticking point. And then uh, again, ambiguity is unsettling. So we've got to get the logistics and operations down and we need to look at the um, providing our staff and our students and our parents with emotional wellness and support. Next slide. So what's the next step? On June 23rd, um, bringing a final recommendation on the hybrid models. Um, the progress reports um, on our drivers and scenarios, letting the board know where we are and what progress we have made on our work. And then finally, um, we did get guidance from the state of California yesterday. Um, I think everyone was hoping for uh, more direction um, and, and mandates and um, that did not come, but uh, we did get guidance that we can use and we'll also, as I said, be getting guidance from our local public health um, tomorrow. Uh, so with that, I believe that's the last slide. Mr. Rickman, is it? It is. Thank you for, for uh, hanging on with me. That was a lot. Um, <laughs> so we will go to questions now. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wagnick. Uh, I do think, um, that it would make sense to hear the presentation about the parent survey quickly, hopefully, <laughs> um, if it can be 10 minutes or so, because I just feel as though the questions are will be all encompassing. Uh -huh. And given the hour, um, I wanna be as efficient as possible. Absolutely. So then we'll have, if that's okay with you all board, then we'll have questions on both uh, once, once we hear the presentation of the parent survey. Okay, Mr. Atsoka. Okay, so I have Andy Morehouse from EMC Research ready to walk the board through the slides. Let me just do a one minute preamble about this. Um, board, you saw the survey questions. Um, <clears throat> the response volume was good. Um, 
just some background for our district surveys, we try to get to 30% of our district uh, parent base. And I think we got up to about, it was somewhere about 25%. So, you know, good, we'd like higher. Um, am I coming through or am I frozen? You're oh, good. I'm good, okay. Um, I also wanted to let the board know that um, the percent of response from our Spanish speaking families is, is lower than we would like. And so we just want the board to hold these results with that in mind that we're gonna seek input from our Spanish speaking families through other means um, as we go through the planning process in the summer. So just that's the preamble. I'm going to uh, ask Mr. Rickman if he can um, pull up the PDF. <clears throat> and then you'll hear the voice of Andy Morehouse from EMC Research. Um, Andy. Hello, good evening. Um, thanks for hanging in there on this super important topic. Um, I'm Andy Morehouse, I work with EMC Research. We came in and we helped um, the staff here do a survey of parents in the district uh, on the topic of reopening schools. I just have a couple slides to walk through here with you tonight and of course happy to answer any questions if you have any at the end with regards to the survey specifically. Uh, a quick note here on methodology. Um, obviously the survey was largely about reopening schools. We also asked some other contextual questions to get at some underlying attitudes and sentiments as well. The district did do uh, messages via email and text message as well as phone call notifications to to encourage participation participation among parents in the district. We just did this last week, so these numbers are hot off the press here for you, and we tried to compile them quickly. Um, ultimately, we had over 3,000, uh, 3,666 completed surveys to be exact, and of course, we offered them in English and Spanish. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Rickman. Um, so some high level key findings here, and then I'll walk through the numbers a little bit more specifically. I'll move through this quickly. I know it's late in the evening. Um, we are seeing some concerns around COVID among respondents to the survey, definitely. Um, however, ultimately respondents are also rating the district very positively in their response to school closures. We are seeing some concerns um, there on the quality of education and learning materials and also the effectiveness and frequency of communications with teachers. Um, this is actually pretty consistent with what I've been seeing uh, throughout the state and other parts of the region as well when looking at public school parents. Um, we are seeing many, of course, feeling the challenge of local school closures. However, ultimately today, two thirds of respondents, parent respondents are at least somewhat comfortable with their children attending reopen schools in the fall. Uh, and we do see that comfort increase when they've read some potential actions that are being considered by the district. So a little more specifically here into the numbers. Next slide, please. I wanted to show you here the, the different activities uh, that we presented to respondents here. Uh, we presented these randomly. I have them ranked here in uh, in order of total percent uh, willing to engage in this activity, you see rising to the top, shop in a grocery store, 81% total willing. And then right behind that, send your child children back to school at 64% total willing. Uh, this is actually really interesting because we're seeing still some hesitation among respondents when it comes to other activities such as uh, you know, eating in a restaurant or shopping in a clothing store. So seeing over half indicate that they're willing to send their child to school is a is, um, pretty significant number. Next slide, please. Um, so here a little bit specifically on ratings in these different areas with regards to the district thinking about the past few months. So thinking about the time during school closures. Um, we're seeing actually over half of parent respondents here rate the district as excellent or good in all of these different areas. So lots of blue, lots of positive ratings on this slide where you start to see the red creep in. So the, the ratings of fair or poor are, um, you see towards the bottom here, concerns a little bit about the quality of education, learning materials, and that effectiveness and frequency of contact with your children's teachers. Um, these numbers I'd say are, are very consistent with what I've been seeing statewide and also even nationally among public school parents when it comes to, to distance learning. Next slide, please. 
Uh, we also asked uh, respondents, parents in the district, how challenging has it been for you and your family to have local schools closed? You see here 67% say it's at least somewhat, if not very challenging, with only 32% saying not too challenging or not challenging at all. And we're seeing the challenge a little bit higher here among parents who have younger students, so elementary age students as compared to parents who have high school students, and then also those who are in special education programs, foster youth services, free reduced lunch programs as well. Um, so here we post this statement as of right now, I feel comfortable with my child or children attending school in person when the district schools reopen in August of August 18th. We asked this initially in the survey very early on um, to get an initial read on parents before we gave them some additional information on some of the things the district was considering, some potential actions. And you see that response there on the left, that initial response. So 66% of parents um, agree with this in total. So 34% strongly agree with this statement, 32% somewhat agree, giving us about two thirds of parents today um, respondents today feeling comfortable. And then we also, after asking this, presented a series of different actions that the district is considering with regards to reopening schools. And then once we posed that whole list, uh, which I'll show you here in a moment, we re-asked this question. Now, given everything you've read, how do you feel right now um, on your comfort level with your child or children attending schools in person when they reopen August 18th? And you see that response there on the right-hand side. Um, so an increase in that strong, that strong agreement with this statement, that dark blue up to 44%, and then the total agree moves from 66% to 77% of parents responding here to this survey. Next slide, please. So this slide and the slide following, I've broken it up into two slides to show the different actions that we presented in the survey that the, the district is considering with regards to reopening schools. Um, again, we presented these randomly. I have them ranked here in an order of percent uh, support. So parents supporting the district really moving forward with an action like this. Um, and again, it's broken into two slides here. So this first slide shows the top tier of actions that parents are supportive of. Um, really ultimately focusing very explicitly on, uh, you know, preventing the spread of COVID, doing more frequent disinfections, requiring students to stay at home if they're sick or if they've had close contact with a confirmed case. Um, and then if you move on to the second slide here, we see a number of, thank you, a number of parent respondents uh, still show high levels of support with these actions as well. Um, over half for everything tested here. Um, these ones that fall more towards the bottom, having said that, it's still two thirds, three quarters, right? And that 80%, 60 to 80% percent support um, are the kind of the more mechanisms that get you to the, to the, to the outcome of, you know, the health and, and safety, health safety issues. So for example, changing schedules so students will only be on campus two to three days per week, 69% support this versus at the top of the slide, reducing class sizes to keep six feet of separation between students and staff at 81%. So on the next slide here, you see we asked a series of open-ended questions as well. And I wanted to give you um, just kind of a summary, I think of what we were seeing in those open-ended questions. Uh, these are two that we posted. What are your concerns, if any, about schools reopening? And you see we did a little word cloud here on the verbatim responses. Um, you know, a lot of responses about the virus, which, which you can see here, concerns around underlying health issues of kids and others and or others in the household of the children, um, kids not being able to follow social, social distancing, potential relapse of the virus, spreading of the virus. Uh, what are your concerns, if any, about schools not reopening? You see you learn really stand out here. Um, a lot of the responses really about the quality of learning, um, you know, the difficulty of distance learning right now, um, comments about kids learning better in schools, worries about kids missing out on socialization, their mental health, um, falling behind in school, and of course the difficulties of parents having to miss work, some parents having to miss work. So those are all the slides I have for you. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any.
Um, before the board <clears throat> dives into some questions, um, uh, EMC is going to continue to analyze the open-ended responses for us. They're going to give us a, a, a more detailed summary. Um, they just couldn't accomplish that in like, I don't know, two days notice. Um, so that's part of their work. Um, I think that will be helpful. Just as Fran commented, it's the, the kind of the wealth of information in the narrative is really important. Um, and I just wanted to highlight something, you know, we don't have to go back to the slide, but the, the parents, um, I guess ratings of how we've done through the pandemic uh, has been really good. In fact, very, very good. Yes, we have some challenges with the quality of learning, learning materials, um, but to have those numbers at that slide, um, it just speaks to the, the response of our staff, our teachers, um, everybody. So we're really proud of that. Um, that's a survey result that I'm used to seeing from EMC. And that's, that's a question I always go straight to. It's like, okay, what do people think about us as a school district? So it's glad to see those numbers. So we'll turn it back to the board um, to now ask questions really about the two combined reports, um, opening of school and then the parent survey results. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Morehouse. That was good. Uh, and I combining them also just reiterates how much this input is important. I know with Dr. Wagnick's report, that was so much based on all of the work with the teachers and the design teams and the input with our, our um, union leaders, et cetera. So uh, let's open it up and, and try to tackle this massive topic here. Ms. Ford, I saw your hand up. Uh, yes, thank you. Ms. Morehouse, I just wanted to commend you on the survey. I think sometimes we create surveys that are, uh, sort of force people just to react with a gut feeling, but this is a survey that was crafted to uh, give people information and sort of force them to think. So thank you. I, um, I also wonder how crazy of an idea, I guess this is really for Mr. Matsuoka is how crazy is it to consider um, sending it one more time out to the people that didn't respond? I just think I agree with you that I think it's a it's a little bit of a a, a lower response rate than one would hope, and um, it just seems like if we could send it out one more time with a three to five day kind of window, I, I'd love to see more responses. Um, I'll, I'll give an initial response and then ask uh, Andy her opinion. Um, you know, they do this all the time for hundreds of organizations. And the question that I would ask Andy is the statistical reliability when you get to 3,700 responses. I mean, would we see a change if we got another 500 to 1,000? I, I mean, it's a great it's a great question. Um, I think that I was actually very pleasantly surprised by the the number of parents who really engaged with the survey and completed the survey in, in a short window and very quickly. Um, I think that really speaks to how involved the community is in sitting in this board meeting and listening, you know, to, to your parent engagement. I think it's very powerful. And I think having the opportunity to have them um, share their voices, um, I think is, is really great of you to be doing, especially with such an important issue. I'd say for something like this, maybe what I would really encourage is, um, you know, waiting just a little bit and then maybe going out with a, with a new set of questions or a similar set of questions, you know, um, as any poll is, this is really just a snapshot of opinions at a certain point in time. And of course, opinions on this issue particularly are changing a lot and very frequently uh, among everyone, not just parents, um, but parents, I'd say probably uh, in particular. Um, so this doesn't necessarily mean that parents will have the same attitudes on this today um, versus tomorrow, you know, a month, three months from now. Um, so we really tried to design this questionnaire in a way that we could go back and ask the same questions or similar questions in the future um, to really track opinions over time to see if they're changing or if your outreach and communications um, are, are really having an impact. I, I would add to this dialogue that as um, we get narrowed down to a school model, 
um, I think that it would be really helpful to now ask parents um, related, but now different sets of questions. Okay, so now that we're landing on this model for elementary or this model for secondary, how does that shape your or inform your opinion about sending kids back to school? And so uh, I think what Ms. Morehouse is recommending is redo a survey, but down the road, but ask more up-to-date questions. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. I think this is, I mean, things are changing. I know if we're in this um, tension of needing to make plans, but also knowing that this virus is, is changing and that information is changing. So we're, we're trying to find that balance of making decisions and making plans. And really, if you look at what Dr. Wagner provided, it's three different models, which means we're planning for all of it. We're planning for full opening. We're planning for full distance and we're pulling and we're planning for hybrid and by planning for hybrid you're planning for all three so i agree that this is not the only survey and the only chance and i say to parents um you know who didn't participate in the survey you know i i i've gotten the most thoughtful and intelligent interesting ideas from parents on this topic and i encourage that to continue and we can pass this on and and digest it ourselves so with that um i will turn it to dr reed for her question or comment yeah, I guess the, the first thing I wanted to do is just really acknowledge the parents who spoke in public comment and I can hear in their voices. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a very challenging time and, and to be dealing with this with your children and your experiences. And so I just want to, my heart goes out to the families um, during this, you know, this process that we really don't know what exactly we're going to do at this moment in time um, and also for the parents that have reached out to me asking questions um, and just talking about their concerns about their children um, learning you know or you know and and the concern of um, their ability to support that learning and um, and also be able to work and and carry on with their with their lives so I, I just wanted to acknowledge that first and um, first and foremost. Uh, secondly, the what I wanted to just bring forward when we're talking about this these survey questions, you mentioned, Mr. Matsuoka, um, that there was a smaller population of Latinx families that were involved in this survey. So my my question would be that um, well, that's a concern for me, because if we have over 60% of our population is um, Latinx, then, then, and we're missing a large percentage of that, are we getting, is that something we should be thinking about in resurveying prior to the next step, which you're suggesting when we have more information? Um, I'll, I'll offer some beginning comments and then I, I bet Dr. Ramirez would have some, some helpful comments here because he, you know, he works so closely with our uh, DLAC committee and our Latinx population. Um, this kind of survey, um, you know, it's quick. It, it uses technology, but I think there's a place for focus groups for listening um, to people and uh, what I've heard from the, the team is to use different methods to get uh, the on the ground feel. Um, so uh, Dr. Ramirez, I mean, we talked briefly in cabinet about some of the other strategies to, to get the pulse in our Latinx community. Can you add some commentary to this? Uh, sure, uh, I, I think uh, to address the questions about the survey specifically, um, the way in which we have uh, undertaken surveys and what we've learned works better for our families, our Spanish-speaking, uh, Spanish-dominant families specific, specifically, is to ensure that we have the supports in place to be able to help them actually uh, navigate the, the um, surveys themselves. So, and it's a combination of both the hardware and technology uh, and helping them navigate that component, but also the content of the actual survey itself. So uh, in the past, when we've undertaken uh, the, Cal, uh, the, the Cal School Survey, for example, uh, it, was a, it was a long enough window and there was always an expectation there would be on-site support 
to be able to help them navigate through the questions that naturally emerge. Um, to go back to the, to the point that uh, Mr. Matsuoka made around focus groups, I think those can be very helpful in provided, providing quality, uh, qualitative data and qualitative information that rounds out the snapshot that we get from surveys. Um, so where I would point to um, that being done is through our LCAP pack, for example, uh, where we've had multiple installments of a, a pretty, uh, pretty rounded uh, representation of our Spanish speaking families from high school to elementary. Um, and then we can engage in dialogue uh, differently unpacking the, the survey and other opinions that surface. Uh, obviously we've been like, uh, like other operations and, in, and engagement strategies, those have been compromised. So we do have, uh, we do have uh, a thought to bring that to DLAC next week. That's a start. Uh, but we will have to engage in other methods to get better feedback from our Spanish speaking families. Okay, well, I guess clearly I would think that that would be something we would want to push forward on. I mean, if we're not getting the representation, we certainly need to have the best possible way to get that representation in this process. Well, if we had a, a longer run up to, let's say, a follow up survey and we could plan ahead and we can get our parent engagement unit, you know, sort of working on the ground, helping families take the survey. I mean, literally, this thing went from an idea into production to this board agenda in about 12 days. Um, so, you know, we had to move fast. We thought it was really important to get some initial results from our parents. I think I want to make sure that we all appreciate the big picture of this. I mean, a month ago, we were wondering, are our parents going to send their kids to school? These results show very clearly our parents are really ready to send their kids. Yes, they have concerns we need to solve. Uh, but when, after all that, to have 70, 77% of our parents say, I'm ready, um, give, me, give me options and give me some confidence in your procedures, but that's, that was really helpful data for us to know. Uh, Ms. Munoz. Yes, I was going to say, I understand, you know, the concern about um, the representation and the input. Um, I was also thinking along those lines and, and agree with Dr. Ramirez in terms of um, the approach as to how to solicit the um, information and this is truly incredible and you know so impressive in terms of how um the sur how the, the amount of surveys that were returned with um with with my day job with um San Cal health we send out health surveys um to thousands you know um uh, of our members and we have you know like 45 days where we do this 45 days for you know, let's see if they return them within 10 days, if not a call, et cetera, you know, three calls total, you know, a lot of outreach and this and that. And, um, and it is a different approach we find also with, you know, with the um, Spanish speaking um, folks and, and so forth. And first having to explain, okay, why are, why are you calling me, you know, and, and such. So I think, you know, one, this is an incredible, um, um, in terms of what you got done, accomplished in a short time frame, and the clarity of the results that were obtained, and then also it helps to know that you know that you found it consistent, um, Andy, <laughs> with Morehouse, with um, with other surveys that you had done with um, with parents on this, and like as um, as Mr. Maxioka said, like in the future, you know, when we're going to have a survey, a follow-up survey, you know, having more time and more, you know, in terms of um, multi-level approaches, such as um, focus groups and such, I think would be a good idea that I'd certainly support. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. Ms. Ford. Oh, thanks so much. Um, this is, I have a couple of comments and I don't have any real questions only because this is a 
an extremely comprehensive and, re and very reflective and thoughtful uh, plan that has been presented. Um, Ms. Wagenek, I, you and your team actually really went above and beyond. If you think back to the last board meeting, I was pretty assertive about saying that this board deserved some in, some in-depth information and you guys came through. And I'm so appreciative of that. And in particular, Ms. Wagenek, at one point during this presentation, you heaved a very heavy sigh. So I'm <laughs> thinking that you are probably tired and a bit worried. And I just want to tell you how grateful I am to you and the team that is mostly, I think, right here on this Zoom uh, um, call and meeting um, for what you have put together. And I guess my other comment is that uh, it wouldn't be surprising to anyone that I will say nothing takes the place of a teacher and of the face-to-face -face experience of school. And I really like the way you thought through the elementary schedule. And I would just like to put forth a, a plea that you take a look at finding a way as to whether secondary students could also experience school every day with their teachers. We're working on it. Yeah. That's I'll give you a little teaser for the 23rd. Thank you. Excellent. I just wanted to reiterate that point. Uh, as much as I have as a parent, my own concerns for health and safety, what I do, I do share some, some worry about the secondary models that were the options, because really when it comes down to it, it's just one day a week of school. And um, I know you're working on it. So I just want to add, that my uh, my my support of further development of that and what that could look like. Thank you. I hear that, and we will reiterate. It is our goal to have as many students on campus as we can, given whatever the scenario scenario is. So, thank you, Ms. Munoz. Just real quick, given that it's almost midnight. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wagenick. I didn't mean to um, not, you know, mention in terms of uh, the information that you presented us about reopening school. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, Dr. Reed. Yeah, I just want to, um, you know, I'm asking questions, but I, I do want to say that. Um, it, 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 it's, I, it's exhausting to look at everything that you've put together. I mean, I mean I'm, it's, it's, a, it's a very comprehensive approach and I do appreciate that. And, um, and I, I know that it took a lot of effort and quick effort to, to pull it off. And I appreciate that very much. And I know the parents appreciate it to know that the depth that went into this plan and and this survey and um and thank you andy too for your work and i think it will be really important to continue to um lean on you for your guidance as we go forward with you know potential further surveys that will be pertinent for what we do going forward so thank you for your work Excellent. Okay. Uh, it looks as though we can move forward here with the daunting feeling of that we're just really beginning, but knowing that there's a lot of work to do and a lot of work going forward. And it, it was stated in one of the documents that this is a once in a lifetime career project for, uh, for the team. And, and we're feeling the weight of that. I know the parents sure do. Uh, students, teachers, all of us. So we are in this together. If anything, this pandemic has demonstrated how interconnected we all are uh, by the air that we breathe, but also the fact that our schools are at the heart of this whole scenario of how we reopen. You can't reopen the economy with our schools shut down. Uh, we, we have childcare issues, we have hunger issues, we have economic issues, we have social and emotional learning, all of it all of it <laughs> relates to our schools and it, there is a daunting task before us. And so I say that with admiration for the work uh, that has happened thus far and the intentionality and the commitment of this board 
uh, to be as a part of the process and leading the process and, and being the voice of the community as we possibly can. So uh, thanks to everybody. Thank you um, again to uh, Ms. Morehouse and uh, Mr. Matsuoka and Dr. Wagner, of course, and to the teams, the elementary team and the secondary team who put a lot of time and energy as well as um, our labor, uh, our, our teachers union and our classified union. Okay, with that, we're, we're trudging along here. Um, we'll move on to the next agenda item. I, we are going to skip uh, G4, which is a conversation about the Westside Community Center because it can be taken up next week. Um, so then really what's left here uh, is a report on the adoption of FOSS science. Uh, Dr. Ramirez, can we do this quickly, I would imagine? Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Caps, I will be as brief as possible. Thank so you. Um, as that slide deck gets put up, um, and maybe Mr. Rickman, you can help me out with that. Um, just wanted to, to share with you that, that we have been in the works around um, matters of uh, adopting materials at the elementary space dating back to uh, really the winter and into the, the, into the early parts of this calendar year. Uh, we had plans in, in place to really bring forward a lot of conversation. So this, pro this process is more a bridge that I would like but um, in the narrative, I do describe that we have been undertaking, we have been effectively in a wide scale pilot of uh, FOSS materials for the better part of eight years. And so in some ways, it's about formalizing something that has already been uh, established. Um, the Instructional Council uh, that was newly formed this year was incredibly helpful to that. Um, so you'll see that represented. Um, Mr. Rickman, if you can go to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there's already a full-scale pilot of, um, of, uh, of FOSS um, for, and, and, and which is NGSS aligned in grades kinder through five. Um, we were, as a district, early adopters of NGSS. Uh, that, that was really born out of a partnership with UC Berkeley's Lawrence Hall of Science. At the time, it was considered a Bayside initiative, and uh, it actually uh, reached the point where we were in full partnership with other uh, partner districts as well. Uh, a lot of professional learning, a lot of uh, um, gatherings and, and discussions around the shifts in NGSS, particularly with the uh, new science assessment. Um, and then most recently, there was a, a re-engagement in, um, in that partnership through a development of materials uh, for English language development and our uh, our teachers at Adams piloted that um, those materials this year. They're going to be completed um, now in, in this month in June. We're still on track for that. Um, so that's just a bit of background uh, as, as, you, as you kind of understand uh, why we're bringing this forward at this time. Next slide, please. So in terms of process and timeline, um, next slide, please. Uh, we, we really talk, uh, talked about this with our elementary instructional council um, in January of 2020 this year. Um, and we really talked about all of our, uh, all of our um, curricular spaces and, uh, and disciplines across elementary. Uh, we have um, many uh, materials that we have already engaged in large scale pilots. But after a lot of deliberation, con uh, conversation and dialogue, we arrived at um, NGSS and FOSS being that first uh, wave. Um, we had plans, pretty, pretty robust plans that we were going to execute on um, from March through uh, June, through now. Uh, but obviously many of those were, uh, we were unable to fulfill. Um, the the uh, partnership with UC Berkeley I mentioned earlier uh, they have plans on, um, and we've already discussed uh, the parameters around a future publication because they're very interested in bringing this forward to other districts. There's a lot of interest um, and uh, many, many um, points of research 
indicate that uh, language development through the rich content of science is a phenomenal way not only to engage students, but to really engage in deep discourse that is very helpful to the development of um, students, uh, not just linguistic ability, but also uh, connects really neatly with, uh, with content that is very relevant and uh, rich in its own right. Um, as we talk about elementary teachers, I'll get to the, the adoption questionnaire in just a moment, uh, but we also want to continue this engagement going through those more formalized processes of displaying materials for the 30 day windows and, and so on um, through the months of the month of June and into July, uh, potentially bringing this back uh, if there is um, if there is support for it, um, a plan in August for for full adoption. Sorry, if you can uh, move to the next slide. So the next two slides really point to participation. As I mentioned, the Instructional Council was really pivotal in bringing this forward. We re-engaged uh, last month um, several times and talked through um, uh, their willingness. Uh, and they started to have conversations with their peers more informally, and they felt like we could still move forward. So what you have here is a participation of a questionnaire, uh, 72 responses. That puts us at approximately 50% um, roughly, or 50% um, of our of our um, elementary teaching staff, uh, most of our PLCs run in the range of 20, 20 to 20, 25 or so on average. So you'll see there the breakdown in in the grades. Next slide, please. And so here is the 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 count based on that participation. Uh, we asked them, this was one of the very specific questions. We had a number of, we have about two or three actually open-ended questions. Um, and, and you see the breakdown, um, high degrees of recommendation um, uh, on, the, on that end. And one caveat to the recommendation with reservations, much of the commentary that emerged from that uh, group was really about next year. Not, not as many questions so much as the content there were a few, of course, but it were, they were more questions pertaining to um, how do we teach hands-on science, which this really is effectively uh, doing um, within a blended environment, much less a, a, um, a remote environment. Uh, the second broad theme that emerged was the need for uh, continued professional learning and engagement in that, uh, per particularly because there was... Um, we, there have been, of course, new hires and uh, people who have since moved grade levels that want to continue to engage in their um, professional learning in this arena. And final slide. So with that, I, I just wanted to, you know, give you a, a, a very high level view of, of where we've been, where we uh, intend to go next, and some of the promise for the future. Um, understanding that we've, uh, again, invested um, for a number of years now in, um, in FOSS specifically in those grade levels. So with that, if the board has any questions for me, I'd love to, to answer them. Um, and recognizing that this is a report, uh, there, there may be future questions that may emerge as well. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Any questions or comments from the board? I think we're, oh, Ms. Ford, I was about to say we're speechless, but Ms. Ford has a question or comment. Uh, just a, a quick one for Dr. Ramirez, and that is that a, a few of my schools in the past have used FOSS, and the biggest concern was the cost of the kit and kits and the replacement of the materials, mm -hmm. and wondering what you're thinking about that. Well, we've, we've that's a great question. We've built in into the budget, um, annually uh, for the first couple of years when we had the Bayside Initiative. Believe it or not, the, 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 the public was really uh, uh, tremendous in supporting this because it came from a parcel tax. Uh, but over the years, we were able to bring that into our, um, our just our budget, our district budget for instructional materials. And so they, they were tremendous in outfitting that first big push around getting the kids into all classrooms. And we've been able to really uh, budget for the replacement kits. Um, our consultant, Holly Gill, has been fantastic 
uh, leading um, an NGSS leadership team uh, that also helps in curating those materials and supporting, but she has really run point on that over the years. And so I feel like we, we are in good position to continue that work into the future. I'll just mention that we found it was so successful also to use Parent Square to ask parents for a lot of these materials because a lot of them are things that they can just add to their laundry, I mean, uh, their grocery lists. And, um, and it is a, a, a Parent Square is great for so many reasons, but also because you can specifically target certain classes and parents and ask them for help. Sure. And some of, and some of these are very common items, as you know, uh, but um, others are specimens. And so we want to make sure that, um, that we always have a reliable source to be able to make those uh, materials and um, uh, available to our teachers to encourage them to continue to, to, um, to engage in that, that sort of learning for our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, here we go. Um, at the end of our agenda items here. Um, let's see, just making sure <laughs> that there aren't any items needed to return to uh, coming events, future agenda items. I think we know what our future agenda items are after today's discussion and we have a lot of work to do. And so our next meeting is a regular school board meeting on Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020 uh, at 6.30 p.m. And again, because of the coronavirus, that will be remote virtual participation only. So with that, uh, to my board members and to our team and Mr. Matsuoka and to all of the participants, we're ending the night here with 55 of them, started with almost 300. Uh, appreciate everybody's time and energy and commitment to our students. That's what we're here for. And I just want to thank this, the team, the staff, the cabinet uh, for all of the hard work during this extremely, extremely challenging time. And with that, I move to adjourn with no objections. Okay, adjourn. I don't have a gavel, but it's here and we will see you all soon. Take care.